Well, hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to the live stream. This is good timing that it just turned five o'clock, right? As Freya is climbing up onto my hat. Uh, she is much too big to be on my hat, but we'll see how this goes. She's done it twice now. I've already pulled her off my hat because uh, it really, it's just, it's a fairly expensive hat, believe it or not. And it's not designed for a, I don't know what, 4,000 gram, 3,500 gram female ball python but we'll see what happens okay hi everybody uh glad you're here let's see I, so so many people uh are in the live stream already um somebody give me a give me an idea of how the sound is coming through if if it's uh good so far glad you all made it so many people are here Okay, we have a lot to do this evening, and um, as some of you may have seen, if you were in here early, uh, oh, a Amy's here. I was talking about, I was just about to talk about, I was just going to talk about Amy, and uh, she's here still, but she's leaving, and um, my guess is that I might still be sitting here talking by the time she gets out of her dance class thing. Uh, so... And I know a lot of you are here just for Amy. So don't leave. She might be back after her dance. <laughs> um, okay, Freya, this is going to be a problem. All right. Here we go. All right. So the first thing I wanted to... Let me do this. I'm, this is stressing me out because <laughs> I just... I just don't feel like my hat is going to be strong enough for the weight of this girl. Um, I wanted to start off with Freya because she is one of my only large snakes that's not currently breeding. So I can pull her out and handle her a little bit because uh, she kind of she goes later in the season than everybody else. All right. Let's really quick talk about the scotch portion of snakes and scotch. I don't have scotch today. What I have, let's, you know what? Let's do this first. I'm going to, I'm going to show you the bourbon. I have a couple of things. I have this bourbon in, first of all, in my snake glass that my neighbors and good friends, Yoli and Lewis got for me when they were in um, Joshua Tree National Park. All right. So that bourbon is from a company that most of you may not have heard of called J.J. Fister Distilling. And uh, they are local to Sacramento. I'm going to tell you why I was in Sacramento. We're going to talk about that in a minute because that's relevant. But my hotel was right down the street from this distillery. And I always, whenever I'm out of town, I always look up to see if there's any distilleries around or like um, scotch bars or anything like that because those are fun to go to. I don't like just hanging out in a bar, but if there's something cool around, I'll go to it. And there was something cool and I went to it. Uh, so uh, JJ Fister is a distillery. And then they've got like, they've got a really cool, you can go and, and do a tasting, but they also have a kitchen and they've got, you can have dinner there or whatever, lunch, whatever. Um, it's a really, really nice place. And uh, here's the other thing that I'm drinking from them. This, this was, uh, I was very curious about this. This is Drakus. And what it is, is uh, distilled mead. Do you guys know what mead is? Hang on, I'm going to taste this really quick. Mm. It's so good. All right, so mead is very near and dear to my heart because I make it sometimes. It's uh, fermented honey, basically. And it's what they believe, what historians believe, was the first alcohol ever made. It was like, they think that people left a barrel of honey outside and it fermented and they decided to drink it. And, you know, like rain got in, it probably rained on it. So it got some water and yeast grew and, uh, that happened. So, um, anyway, I, I enjoy mead and I make mead occasionally. Um, although I haven't in over a year and, uh, this is distilled mead. So, so what mead is basically is you just take honey and water and ferment it. And I always add like oranges and cinnamon and stuff like that to flavor it. But 
at the basic core, it's fermented honey. That's it. So what they do with this Drakus is they they do their fermented honey and then they distill it. So they're distilling mead and making a liquor out of it, uh, which it's um, it's more like wine when it's mead. It's it's honey wine, basically. And uh, when you distill it, it becomes a liquor. And this does not taste like mead. I mean, it's a very sweet. Uh, you know, it's definitely liquor. It's not, it's not meat at all. And I wouldn't, if I had just drank this, I wouldn't know what it was. And I wouldn't guess that it came from mead, but it's absolutely delicious. And I'm drinking out of my JJ Fister, uh, Glen Karen glass. I don't know if you can see the thing. I'm usually drinking out of my green room pythons, Glen Karen glass, but they gave me one of these because, so I went there. I'll tell you why I went there. And then we're going to talk about why I went there. Uh, after I finished telling you about J.J. Fister. So I was up in Sacramento for the Save the Snakes Venomous training course. And uh, because I have uh, occasionally worked with venomous snakes since I was in high school. So I've done it a number of times and I feel like I know what I'm doing, but you don't know what you don't know. So that's the course that if you watch Snake Discovery, they went and took a one day course. Um, I took the weekend course. Does that make me better than Ed and Emily that I took the weekend course and they just took the day course? I mean, some would say maybe, but you know, it's, it's not my place to judge whether I'm now better than them as people because I took the two day course, but it is, I do have a leg up on them. I will say that. So, uh, anyway, <laughs> enough of those shenanigans. Uh, so the point is that uh, this place was, this distillery was right in between my hotel and the Save the Snakes facility. We're going to talk about that thing uh, in, in a bit. But um, they, what was I going to say about it? I forgot. The, the, anyway, the point is that that they make uh, bourbon and rye and uh, um, this drachis. And I think they do brandy and some other things too. But I'm more of a scotch guy and I like mead. So... Uh, Anyway, I, so the first night I became friends with, with some of the bartenders and such like that. And then, uh, the second night I became friends with the manager and then he introduced me to the, the director of whatever, I don't know. Uh, but the director of whatever, I don't know that I can't remember his title, uh, uh, used to, used to have a reptile facility and, uh, or, a, or a reptile, not a reptile facility, but a reptile room in his, in his house. So he was a big reptile guy. And so we chatted a lot and he allowed me to purchase some bottlings that were not for sale. Like, like this bourbon, this is their first bottling of bourbon. This is a distillery that's been around for five years. And, um, when you're only a few years old, you're, you're normally making your liquor, uh, offsite somewhere else and, and have, or having it trucked in, you know? Uh, they're just now starting to make, uh, their, their stuff there at their facility. So that was their first bottling and I got some of that. And then I got some of this Drakus, uh, which they are selling and, um, they've got really, really great stuff. Uh, but my point, geez, this is Freya is really attracted to getting up on this hat and it's going to be a problem, I think. My point is this, that I made friends with those people and uh, got a few, a few bottles of if, uh, if you, if you buy anything from J, uh, JJ Fister Distilling Company, first of all, if you're not in California or Arizona, you can't buy from them. So I'm going to just say this quickly. If you are in one of those two states, they will ship to you, California or Arizona. And my favorite is their high rye bourbon but I don't have any left because this was a few weeks ago and I bought one bottle and I made that sort of my drink of choice for a while. So it's gone, which is unfortunate. Uh, but anyway, they are. Um, so I talked to those guys. I told them that I was going to do the live stream and I was going to be drinking their uh, delightful liquids on the, uh, dang it, on the live stream. And um, hang on, I'm trying to wrestle my snake here. Ugh. And so they um, they gave me a discount code for anyone who's watching this that is in California or Arizona. 
And this is good until, I don't know, January or February, whatever. Discount code is just Pythons. Just, just Pythons, plural. And uh, I think it's 15% off of their stuff. So that's pretty cool. Um, let me see. Is that right? Yeah, Pythons. Yeah, the, yeah. So uh, they're saying it'll be up until around mid-January. But anyway, it's a, it's a small distillery. They're doing a great job. They have a ton of offerings and I like them a lot. So we're not doing, we're not drinking scotch in snakes and scotch today. We're drinking Dracus and bourbon. Look at, look at Freya. She's just trying to get back up on that hat. It's just Freya. It's not, a, this is not a good spot for you. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. What else do I want to say about that? Okay, that's that. Let's let's just talk about Save the Snake since I since I mentioned it. So uh, I went up there. I've been doing occasionally. I've been doing these gigs where a production company will call me and say, "Hey, um, we're we're filming out in Topanga Canyon, for example, which is which is in around L.A. where I where I live, uh, and there's snakes, and can, we need a we need a snake wrangler. Can you do it?" So uh, I will go out with my bucket and my snake hook and such like that and be a snake wrangler. And it's fun. And uh, I want to start doing that more because when a commercial or a TV show or something like that hires me as an actor to be on set, uh, I get a certain day rate and I get residuals, which is great as, as, it, as it goes. But as a snake wrangler, I found out that you can be on set and make almost as much as a day of being an actor. I won't make the residuals, but it's pretty good pay because as it turns out, there's not a ton of people that want to be on set all day dealing with potentially venomous snakes. So, um, and there's a lot of areas around Southern California where filming happens for TV shows, movies, commercials, anything, photo shoots. We did a photo shoot for, for Nike, uh, recently. And, uh, they're, uh, they're, they're filming out in, in snake country. In fact, uh, Warner Brothers owns a lot. It's not their main lot, but their secondary lot has tons of rattlesnakes on it. So they always need a snake wrangler. So anyway, uh, I don't have um, uh, any formal training in it. I just have experience since I was in high school and uh, no formal training. So I thought if I'm going to actually do this, I should probably get some formal training and find out what I don't know because you don't know what you don't know. And I took this uh, venomous training course uh, or handling course at Save the Snakes, and it was it was really cool. It was fun. Uh, lots of lots of information. Uh, some stuff that I did know. A lot of stuff that I didn't know. I learned a technique of of double containment, which I've never done before. Um, using a using a bag and a bucket. Normally, I just put snakes in a bucket with a hook, um, but that was cool to get that sort of. Um, the, the you know it's it's a choreographed thing that you do so that you're so that you're never in danger of actually getting bit by the by the rattlesnake and uh we worked with we started off working with non-venomous snakes we we used uh, a king snake what do we have out there a, a king snake and oh and a gopher snake king snake and a gopher snake to just get it down and then we brought out the rattlesnakes and um worked with them super fun weekend so I'm going to use some of that uh, knowledge and you're going to see a little bit of some maybe herping type clips within the Green Room Pythons videos coming up in the coming year and uh, might be going out with Michael, who's the head of Save the Snakes. He's a wildlife biologist and uh, I might do a little trip with him in Northern California. So you'll see some of that. So. I'm excited about that. Uh, Save the Snakes is a great organization that uh, works all over the world. They have they have people all over the world working to save the snakes, doing a lot of stuff with cobras, which is cool. Um, just all kinds of things. Freya, you are going to be a problem. I can already tell. You are going to. You are. I'm sorry. I startled you. Okay. Hold on. Let me try to get her off my hat again hey what can we do here can you just hang out with me instead of on my hat can we can we try that how about that okay uh so 
Look at this. Right back up to the hat. Hi. Hi. Are you trying to get back up on the hat? Please don't. Okay. So, you guys, we have so much to cover today. So, I will say this. Um, any questions for me? I know that a lot of you at this point are chatting amongst yourselves, which I think is great. Chat amongst yourselves. I'm not going to do a lot of going all the way through the chat uh, to find stuff because we have a lot of stuff to cover, but I will try to answer any questions that you have for me in the chat. If you have a question for me, super chat it. That is where I'll most likely see it. I'll try to answer some others as I see them, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to scroll through through as thoroughly as I often do, just because we have so much to cover today. Uh, all right. Let me take a sip of this Drakus and I think they created the name Drakus, by the way, for distilled mead. They're, it's made in other countries, but apparently I think they're the only ones in the United States that make distilled mead. And they call it Drakus, which is a cool name. Sounds like it's a drink that like a Klingon would, would make. Star Wars fans. All right. Can you not handcuff me, Freya? Thanks. Okay. What else uh, do I want to talk about? Let me see if I let me see if there's any questions for me here, really quick. Let me just. So um, also, if you have a question for me and you and you started off, whether you super chat or not. If you don't super chat, I might still find it. I'm not saying you have to to ask a question. Do this in capital for your question. Bob, and do the do the. All right. So I mean, I'm scrolling. There's so much, so much chat here. You guys, welcome everybody. I'm glad you're here. Okay. I have a bunch of questions from the horde of keepers over on Patreon. And I'm going to start going through those. And uh, what I think I'll do, was there a glitch? I just saw people say there's a glitch. Is it is it working? Somebody confirmed that they can see and hear me okay? Okay. I'm going to assume that everything's okay, but somebody else confirm. Um. Audio is good. Video is blurry. Oh, crazy. Thanks, Roger. You guys, we got Roger from Gray Family Snakes in the house making some beautiful axanthics. By the way, I'll remind me, don't let me forget, and I'll show you my axanthic that I got from Roger. She's doing great, and she's out of quarantine now, so I can pull her out. Uh, she's such a lovely, well-socialized snake, like right out of the gate. I didn't really have to do anything. Um <laughs> top for it yes uh if you want me to definitely answer your question put it on the patreon when i call for it but because i do that you guys for for uh for my patreon supporters i always tell them a few days before the live stream that it's happening and then i collect their questions and then i print it out so i can read the questions um so but top for it if you have a question just write bob in in caps and uh say your uh say your question um, and I might see it. Okay. All right. I hope that we don't have tons of video problems on this one. That'll be a bummer. Uh, I think the, yeah, the good internet should be connected well. All right. As Freya chokes me out, let me see what else I need to, um, cover here really quick. We got that. We talked about the JJ Fister. I gave you guys the discount code, right? Only if you're in California or Arizona, you can go on their, their website. J period, J period, Fister, P-F-I-S-T-E-R. And uh, discount code Pythons, P-Y-T-H-O-N-S. You get a 15% discount. It is worth it. My favorite is the High Rye Bourbon, if anyone's thinking of ordering from them. Uh, the high ride bourbon is great, but they have a ton of offerings. Like they've got, they've got a lot of stuff. They got all kinds of brandies and 
all kinds of things. Um, and I highly recommend that you try just try the Dracus just because it's such a different, um, it's a different thing. Amy, are you still here? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thanks for the super chat, Amy. Say hello to all the ladies for me. Uh, you're now you're really leaving. Okay. <laughs> See you later. Thanks for that super chat. Okay. Uh, those are, um, for those of you who don't know, I think I've mentioned it before, but Amy is in a belly dance, uh, troupe. Uh, she's one of the leaders of, of this belly dance troupe that is my favorite. And they perform every year at a festival in Utah that I also perform at. So, I've gotten to know Amy. She and I are good friends and um, the rest of the dance troupe I know as well. Um, they're really cool people and fantastic. They are, they are this little town in Southern Utah. You know, I do festivals all over, mostly California, but I do Texas and a bunch of others. And there's always belly dance groups at these festivals. And this group that, that Amy uh, is with in this little small town, Cedar city, Utah is the best belly dance group that, that I know of. So, they're really good. Um, probably because they practice a lot instead of watching the live streams. Uh, hold on. I just saw a great question that I can answer really fast. Where did it go, though? Aaron. My snake is in shed and hasn't come out of his cave at all. I'm worried he will die of dehydration. He won't die of dehydration. Uh, snakes often snakes don't drink much and sometimes they don't drink at all. They get, they get plenty of fluid through the food that they eat. And when your snake is in shed, they're going to be hiding the whole time. So make sure that there's plenty of humidity up there. Uh, put it, at, put it at like, uh, Oh, thanks Angie. Thanks for the super chat. Um, you didn't even ask a question, ask a question. If you have one, that's really nice of you. Uh, so anyway, um, Bump the humidity to about 80% if you can while they're in shed. And then, uh, yeah, they'll be in they'll be in their hide for a week or a week and a half. No problem at all. They just don't need to drink water very often. And if they do need to drink it, then uh, you're I'm sure that you're giving them fresh water on a regular basis. So they know where to they know where to find it if they need it. Uh, top for it. I do. I'm I'm a stand up comic, so I do a comedy show at these festivals, but I also juggle crazy dangerous things flaming battle axes and chainsaw blades that are on fire and stuff like that it's a fun show uh pierce yes i do come to texas ren fest although i'm not this year i i do it almost every year i don't know that i'm gonna keep doing it though because it's a it's a lot uh to to do that festival but um at texas ren fest it's a really fun show i actually don't do my normal show I do a three man comedy show called sound and fury, uh, that, that is there. And, um, I'm just not doing it this year. So that Texas Ren Fest is the largest Renaissance fair in the world though. And, uh, it's, it's really fun to do. Freya is determined to destroy my hat. So we'll just see how this goes. Um, and yeah, yes, Texas Ren Fest, please. <laughs> Yeah, we'll we'll see how that goes. Texas Ren Fest is the largest Renaissance fair in the world. They they pretty much I mean it's really hard to get in if you're a performer that hasn't performed there before. And I the only reason that I perform there is through this other group that's been performing there for 18 years. And I started uh sort of filling in. It's a three-man show and one of the roles uh the the person that was the regular had uh had quit. And so I started filling in and um uh, I don't, I, I, I can't become a regular with them though. So, and I think they're, they're looking to find a regular. So we'll see how it goes next year. If, if it works out. Um, but that's a really fun show to do. It's a lot of, it's a lot of improv and, and silliness and I don't have to juggle dangerous things. Hang on. Let me just take care of this crazy snake. Hey, will you stop it, please? Can you just hang out here? Look at Look at, look at how nice that is. They just hang out here. See, everybody can see you now. You're not messing with my hat. You're not destroying this hat that I paid too much money for. 
Um, all right. <laughs> Amy, uh, I love you all too, uh, Amy, and all the people watching the uh, all the dancers watching the live stream. We love you, and you're our favorite juggler of all time. Favorite juggler of all time. Oh, fire juggler of all time. That's more specific. There's a lot of jugglers that are better than me. But sure, fire juggler. Yeah, I get it. I I almost die just about every show. So, or somebody almost dies just about every show. So, I get it. Anyway, hi to everyone over there in Cedar City that's watching. Those are those are great people. Um, okay. Comfortable survivor, uh, survival. Uh, that's a great question. Just don't have your ball python and your cat meet. I recommend that that people don't have their snakes meet any of their other animals. It's just safer that way. You know, um, a lot of people have their dogs around their snake, and the, the, you know they 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 feel like their dog understands the that the snake's there and it's not a problem or whatever. And that could be the case, uh, but you never know when an animal is going to, like something's going to just change all of a sudden. And that especially could happen with a snake. You know, a snake that's very used to your dog or your cat. I mean, cats probably shouldn't be around snakes at all because they'll kill them. But uh, um, a snake that normally is very used to your dog, they could just be in a mode where they're defensive and all of a sudden bite your dog and cause a lot of trauma. Um, so... That's my thought on that. But you can have a lot of people say, oh, I'd love to get a snake, but I can't because I have a cat. Well, you can have you, you can have a cat and a snake. They're just not going to live in the same area and they don't have to ever meet one another. So. Uh, that is that. Top Ferret, I have a whole bunch of really old stand-up on YouTube. I have a lot of comedy stuff on on YouTube. Um, I'm I'm not putting I'm not putting my show like the show that I do now is very specific. It's in character. It's for Renaissance fairs. I'm not putting any of that on the internet uh, because it's a it's a written show that I kind of don't want to give away. Um, but there's a lot of old stand-up that's on that's on YouTube. Um, Hang on. I also try not to put right. I mean, maybe I should just put more regular stand-up shows up on YouTube, but I, I usually don't. So those are, those are like 10 plus years old that if you find any of my stuff, um, Danielle, you've seen sound and fury. That's great. Uh, yeah. Sound and fury is great. It probably wasn't me when you saw it. I mean, depending on when you saw it, uh, because I've done, I've performed with them, I think the last four, maybe five years, I bet it's four years and I don't do every week into the run. So that Texas Ren Fair is what, eight weeks, nine weeks, something like that. I usually do three or four of those weeks or five of, of those weeks. So there's a good chance that somebody else was in the spot that I, that, that I do of that three man show when you saw it, depending on when it was. Um, but I am one of those guys sometimes. Okay, lots of people talking about TRF. Hang on. Uh, TRF is Texas Ren Fair, you guys. It's the largest Renaissance Fair in the world. It's weird that it's in Texas, but people that live in Texas love Ren Fairs, and it's a really fun one. Yeah, that's nice, Darlene. Thanks. Hit the like button. Uh, and share. Yeah, that's nice. If you're watching this live and, and you like it, hit the, hit the like, that's a, that's a nice thing to do. Um, actually, this is a good question. If you could pick an animal for follow to track, what would it be? Uh, that's a great question. And it, my answer is not practical, but it's a good answer. Hang on. For, okay, for before I answer, for those of you that don't know, Follow is a company that makes these 
right here, these little bracelets. And with when you order a bracelet from Follow, you track, they give you an animal to track. So uh, like, for instance, I have this lion. One, the one in the middle is a lion. And then I think I have a shark one here and I have a penguin one here. And with that comes a QR code to track an animal that that for scientific purposes has a tracking device on them. And you can look up and see where they're at. It's really cool. Uh, and there is, if you look in the description, I think there is, there's a, there's a, uh, discount code for, for follow bracelets. If you want one, they are inexpensive and they help 10% of your, of your purchase goes to, uh, these organizations that, that track and, and save these animals. So my answer though, Ashley, what animal would it be? It would be a Boland's Python. Again, not practical to put a tracker on a Boland's Python, I don't think, but, they are very elusive and we don't know where the males are. Um, there are females that are found. There's a, there's a guy named Ari that goes out almost every year and spends like a month or two in the wild with Boland's pythons. And uh, he's only found females. He knows where they are. He can, he can sit with them in their nests. Uh, apparently they're not defensive when humans are around because they don't have any natural predators in those they live, they live high up in the mountains of, um, I want to say Papua New Guinea, but I also feel like I'm, that's wrong. Somebody put it if I'm right or wrong or whatever. Uh, but anyway, they live high up in these mountains and they don't know where the, they know where to find females, but they don't know where to find males. So I want to track her on, on those. I want to see where they go. Okay. I got to get to these Patreon questions. Okay, here we go. I'm going to put, I'm going to put this one back here in a minute too. Uh, we'll, we'll get a different snake out, I think. You know, you know what we might do? We might try and get the inspector out and just see what happens. Um, he's been, let's talk about the inspector really quick. And then I'm going to get to the questions. I got a lot of stuff to talk about you guys. I'm going to, I'm going to put Freya back right now because she's getting kind of antsy. She's doing really well, getting back up to weight. I don't know that I'm going to breed her this season. I might give her the season off. Uh, hang on. Okay. You just put her in her tub and I'm giving her the option of coming back out and wandering around if she wants to. Um, what was I just talking about? The inspector. Uh, <laughs> so, so the inspector, um, The inspector's been doing this weird behavior where he, I think he sees me as a rival snake because he tries to battle me. Like he, hold on. She's choosing to stay in her tub, so I'm just shutting it. All right, so he's still in breeding mode. For those of you who don't know the inspector saga, uh, you could follow me on Instagram and you'll see some of the some of the stuff. But in breeding season, the inspector is a completely different snake. He's super combative and um, will come up to me to combat with me. And he, so, so what I've been doing, or not what I've been doing, but last time I put him in with, I think it was Damara, he, he was like, I pulled him out of his enclosure and he starts kind of battling with me a little bit. So I just put my arm up by his neck. Now snakes, when snakes battle, they, they do this kind of stuff. Like if my hands are, are their heads, they, they do kind of this sort of combative stuff when they're, when two males are combating for one female, they don't bite. They're not trying to hurt each other, but they're doing this create dominance thing. And uh, so I just put my arm up like this and he started doing it with my arm. So we sat there for like 20 minutes and did male combat and just like this. And then I put him in with, with Damara, like he won. Um, 
really strange. I've never heard of that happening with ball pythons before. And um, I, I assume that they combat in the wild, similarly to how we see other snakes combat. Um, and uh, the inspector certainly does that with me. So, so I don't know. I'm thinking about potentially bringing him out, but I also don't want to, I don't have a female to, to give him to, so I don't want to start his crazy behavior. Um, so let me think about this. I might bring a different snake out. Because what will happen is if I bring him out and then I put him back in, he'll he'll go back in his enclosure and he'll just be all over the place going crazy. And I kind of don't want to start that. Uh, okay. Let's get through some questions, though, from Patreon. Okay. Uh, Taylor's asking, what size do you let your ball pythons start free roaming without worrying about them? Because I swear my guy is lucky. He's cubic. He he's not the sharpest tool in the shed. And I worry that he's going to get stuck somewhere. Um, okay. Uh, so, Taylor, I, for me, I let them, when they're kind of adult sized, um, maybe over a thousand grams, something like that. But I also, it also kind of depends on the personality of the snake. And um, when I do decide that a snake is big enough to free roam, I, I don't free roam them. I, I let them go and then I watch them carefully and I know where they're at for the first few times. I, I know everywhere where they're at and, um, and I just keep my eye on them. And for a snake like Freya or any of the big snakes that are used to free roaming a lot, uh, they just, I just bring them out and they can go wherever they want. But, um, and I know pretty much where they're going to be, you know, if I, if I need to put them away or something. Uh, so that's that it's kind of up to you. Um, I wouldn't let a smaller snake free. I just don't want snakes to like go under the refrigerator or something like that. Like I look around and I see places that snakes can potentially get into. And if they're small enough to still get into a spot that I don't want them into, I wait till they get a little bigger. Uh, all right. Taylor also says, now you don't need to answer this, but I'm just curious. If your snakes were people, what genre of music do you think that they would listen to? Um, it's a great question. I would say that Echo and Stella, oh, who I might get out, my two super dwarves, definitely um, would listen to like goth type music. I think they would shop at Hot Topic and um, they probably would listen to death metal, but not because they liked it. I think they would listen to death metal because uh, because they think it's cool, but secretly they would hate it. So uh, there's that. I think... Um, Dolly would definitely listen to country music. Captain Farrell also country music. And uh, Tiger Lily, probably like Disney show tunes. And she would annoy her neighbors with, with Disney tunes. I could go on, but I'm not, I'm not going to. Maybe, maybe I will put a, put, a, put a name of one of my snakes in, in the comments and I'll tell you what music they listen to. Um, I will say this though. The inspector right now would listen to like nineties gangster rap. But in the off season, when he's not in breeding season, he would listen to Nickelback almost exclusively mixed in with a little bit of Creed, I think is his would be his jam. But right now it's nineties gangster rap. Okay. Um, here we go. Amy says she's not going to be able to make the live stream, but she did. She was here. She might still be here. I don't know. Uh, and she might be back. Tell us more about your weekend at Save the Snakes. What was the certification process like? What cool animals did you get to handle? What are you planning to do with your certification? Um, how much did we already talk about this? Because I was talking about it, right? The Save the Snakes thing. We did. We talked about it a little bit. Uh, so it was a two-day course. And... Uh, the first day is, is just classroom stuff. It's a ton of stuff on venom to toxinology and, uh, the focus is mainly on rattlesnakes in California. Rattlesnakes are the only venomous snake in California, except for occasionally there's a yellow bellied sea crate that will make it up into the, uh, the San Diego area. They are 
um, they're a, they're a sea snake, so they're not, they're never on land, but they're super venomous. And occasionally they're in they're around um, San Diego, but other than that particular snake, the only I should say venomous uh, to humans, like like uh, you know, there's a lot of like um, rear fang type, mildly venomous snakes that are around. But as far as stuff that's a danger to humans, it's just rattlesnakes in California. And so we went over a lot of those um, and different various things. I have a, I have a book that's, that has a lot of really great information. And then day two was all handling. And we, you know, a lot of, a lot of people in the class did, had not handled with a hook. So, so it starts out with a basic, like if you don't, if you don't know how to do anything, if you've never dealt with a snake, it starts off there. And then we go to double hooking, which is something that I had never done. I'd done a lot of single hooking, but never double hooking. So that was cool to practice that. And then, um, uh, they have a double containment system that I had never done. So that was cool to get the steps of, of how to do that. Uh, it, it was great. Totally worth it if if you want to get... Uh, and I got a certification that says I did that thing. Uh, and I made some good contacts. They've got a really cool organization there. They're, they're doing great stuff for venomous snakes all over the world. And I'm going to do... I'm helping them a little bit with their just just consulting a little bit for with, with their YouTube channel because they they want to um, start doing more videos and I think I'm going to go up there and shoot a video with Save the Snakes. We might do one for this channel and maybe one for their channel. Um, but uh, Michael, the guy who who started the organization, is a really great guy. He's a wildlife biologist. He's doing some really interesting things with uh, giant garter snakes. In Southern California, they have a very small range in, in, I mean, not Southern California, it's actually Northern. Uh, they have a very small range in California and I'm pretty sure they're endangered somehow. Um, but he's doing cool stuff with that. So, all right, I'm almost out of Dracus, but never fear. I also have bourbon. Um, oh, we have a super chat. Erica, thanks so much for your super chat. Let's see. Hey, Bob, how do you become a snake wrangler? I'm in SoCal also, and that would be fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I became a snake wrangler because I uh, am an actor and sometimes producer, writer in Hollywood. And there are other production people that know me and they know that I'm a snake person. So uh, I have a I have a friend who um, who lives nearby and he's a uh, he's a um Oh, what do you call it? He, he's in charge of um, locations, like finding locations and, and such like that for various uh, film projects. And so he calls me sometimes when they need a snake wrangler. It's, it's fun. Uh, I don't know how you would do it without. I mean, I, I started doing I always thought it would be cool to do, but I started doing it just because people started asking me. Um, I was in the right place, at the right time. This is the same. This is kind of the same as people always ask me, how do you get into doing voiceover work? And um, I, I don't really know because I started doing voiceover work because some, uh, you know, like a director who had worked with me before in a live action thing is now shooting a cartoon and they need a voice and they think I'd be funny on it. So they call me up. So I do a fair amount of voiceover work, but it's always it's, it's never because I auditioned for something that my agent got me. It's always that the production company calls me up and says, Hey, we want you for this voice. Um, and I don't do a lot of, I, I don't do a lot of it. Like I'm not, I, I do a, maybe a couple of voiceover things a year, but for not being an actor, that's like, I'm not represented by a voiceover agency or anything like that. Uh, that's a fair amount of work for somebody who's not actively looking for that kind of stuff. Um, but that is the same thing as being a snake wrangler. I, I just do it because I have some contacts, which, which I feel fortunate. Um, hang on. But I will say this, that uh, as far as being a snake wrangler, you know, you, you, you've got to know venomous snakes. You have to have experience working with them. I have worked. Um, I mean, I haven't, it's not like I've spent years. It's not like I own venomous snakes or, or, or keep them and have spent years doing it. But since I was in high school, I have 
had many contacts with various venomous snakes. And I used to take sticks and move Mojave greens off the road when I lived in the high desert, when I was in high school, uh, Mojave greens are considered the most toxic of, of rattlesnakes in, in North America. Um, and also people think that they chase you and they're really aggressive, but they're not. Uh, I used to see them on the road and I would stop my car and get them out of the road with a, with a stick. Um, and so now I have hooks and, and, uh, uh, tongs and a bucket. I got a bucket with stickers. You guys, I'm legit. Uh, and on that same note, there's going to be some herping videos. Not, I think what I'm going to do is, is f film some stuff when I go looking for rattlesnakes and, and various, uh, things out in the desert and different places. Uh, I'm going to film some of that and I'll, put it into some regular green room pythons videos. So I don't think I'm going to come out with a video that's just like, Hey, now I'm looking for rattlesnakes because it, it, I, I don't think that it would get the views. Maybe those of you that are watching right now, watching this, this live stream might be interested in just a herping video with me, but I think in general for the channel, it wouldn't do as well. So I'll put clips of my herping trips into regular green room pythons videos. And, uh, I think it'll be cool. It'll be a, it'll be a nice, um, way to get away from this background that everybody sees. <laughs> um, oh, wait, I just showed Erica saying, holy crap, that's not what I meant to show, even though, but it's a great comment though, Erica. What I was trying to show is Top Ferret saying, Bob, will you please show your bucket and stickers? I would love to, but it's in my car, permanently in my car. I wish I had it in here for some reason so I could show you. Uh, it's just the state, the, the bucket. Oh, my bucket, actually, speaking of speaking of mead. That, that is what makes Drakus. Speaking of mead, the bucket that I use is a seven gallon bucket. And I had one when when I was making mead, I had this seven gallon bucket. So it lists all the different bunch of different alcohol making stuff because it's specifically for that. Uh, but now it has all this danger. And on uh, I like a seven gallon bucket better than a five for a venomous rattlesnake. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, Darlene, thanks very much. You have such awesome projects you've been a part of. Uh, so cool that you do voiceover and snake wrangling and fire juggling and acting and you're in a band. Uh, so, <laughs> such a great life. It's, it's, you know, it's a great life sometimes. I appreciate that, Darlene. Um, yeah, I do things that interest me and I figure out how to make a living, how to cobble together a living by doing things that I love. And it took many years for me to figure that out, but it makes for a um, interesting life for me. I think there's a lot of people who would not be able to, like it doesn't have the security that that if I worked, uh, like for instance, I used to be a mortgage broker years and years ago. I, I, was a, in a, I was a mortgage broker. So if I worked at a bank, I would have more security in that I would know how much my paycheck is gonna be every single month. And, uh, and that would be the thing. But I learned a long time ago that I can't do that. <laughs> so uh, this is more interesting for me. I just do things that I like to do and I, and I figure out how to, how to cobble together a living doing it. So that is that. Um, okay, let's get back to these Patreon questions. I have not, I've only gone through a couple so far. I told you we're probably going to run late on this one. I hope you guys don't mind. And I hope you're doing other things. You don't have to be watching me. Like I'm not doing anything. I'm going to grab a snake. That'll be cool to see in a minute. But otherwise, you're just watching me finish my Drakus. That's not that interesting. And then you can listen. Um, all right. So I answered Amy's question. We talked about Save the Snakes. Check out their website, though, you guys. I think it's just Save the Snakes org dot dot org probably save the snakes 
or oh you can't just put save the snakes that'll everything will come up i i think it's save the snakes.org um they're doing good stuff so that's that okay so lori weiser who is my friend she has a snake from me last year um she says i'm upgrading marie and darwin uh soon to their pvc four by two by two enclosures that's great these are two ball pythons that she's that she just got four by two by twos for. Um, they're currently in three foot glass enclosures and I use heat pads on thermostats. I'll be using a ceramic heat for their new ones. They're used to belly heat. So will overhead heat be weird for them? And how does that work over their hot hides? Oh, oh right, over their hot hides. Uh, if they go on top of their hot hide, won't it be too hot? The inside of the hide will have to be 90 degrees. So I think it will be hotter on top of the hide and therefore not good help. Um, yeah, you know, it's not, I mean, when you set this up, Lori, and this is for anybody, when you, when you set something like this up, you're going to check different, there's just going to be different spots. Your hot, hot, you know, let's say that, that let's say that your, your hide is actually 90 degrees inside the hide. It might be 92 or 93 on top of the hide. I can almost guarantee you that your snake is not going to curl up on top of the hide for for any amount of time. You know, it's just going to be too warm for them and they've got other they've got other options. But I, I will also say that I don't believe that it needs to be exactly 90 degrees in the hide. I think I think 88 is fine. Most of my snakes sit at about 88. And uh, so, you know, if you're 90 degrees on top of the hide, you could be 88 um, inside. So that is, um, the other thing is I don't think, and now I might be wrong cause we, I, I don't think we really know this, but I don't think it makes a difference to the snake, whether the heat that they have inside their body right now came from their belly or came from their back. And in the wild, it's going to, for most, for the most part, come from their back. They're going to, they're going to bask in the sun for a minute and then, and then go back into their hole. And, uh, and then there's also the ambient heat in their hole is probably fine. They, they don't need to do a lot of basking, but if they do that, they're going to go and get it from the sun. Um, rather than, you know, maybe they'll find a hot rock to sit on for a minute. that's already been heated by the sun, but I don't think it matters uh, that much. In fact, do I have my, I just wonder, hang on. I want to do an experiment. This might be fun. You guys hang on a second. Oh, there we go. Let's, let's see what the temps are on the inspector's hide. So here, let's move that. Wait, I got to see what I'm doing here. Let's move this over to there. All right, let's just check this really quick. So I have, the, the inspector has, has belly heat that he sits on, on the glass, all the way down on the glass. And then I also have a ceramic heat element that um, sometimes is on pretty hot and sometimes it's, it, it goes back and forth. So that's right. That's the hottest, the hottest spot on the wood. I got to get out of the way. So, so that wood right there, the hottest spot on that wood was 91 degrees. And then this gives me an excuse to mess with the inspector and see what his mood is like. Let's just see what he's sitting at. Pull his hide up. His body is 86 degrees and that's, and that's great for him. Like that's perfect. I tell. Oh buddy. Come here. I tell. And then his, uh, his, his heat mats about 86 right now. It's probably on the way up. Um, but just as a, as a general, um, as a general note, especially for, for newer keepers, you know, we always hear 80 to 90 and, uh, I'm just getting substrate off his belly and then we'll, and then we got the inspector. We'll see what his mood's like. We always see 80 to, you know, 80 on the cool side, 90 on the, on the warm side. 90 sometimes is a little warm for, for snakes and uh, for, for ball pythons. And for some, it's to they're totally comfortable with it. I think, uh, 
I think 88 to 90 is fine. 90 or 91 is fine. It doesn't have to be super exact. They just need enough heat to be able to digest their food. And uh, hi, pal. What's your mood like, huh? Um, and then, uh, you know, their, their cool side, anywhere from 78 to 81, something like that. Let me readjust this camera. Okay. All right. So now we got the inspector. We'll see what he's, what he's up to. He, um, he and I are, well, he's my friend always, but I'm not his friend. <laughs> Uh, during breeding season. So if he's, if he seems like he's a little bit stressed out, I will put him back, but he actually seems like he's doing okay. He's not trying to, he's not trying to battle me or anything right now. Hi buddy. You doing okay? You feeling good? All right. So we're done with the Drakus. We're on to the, this is just their regular bourbon. Again, JJ Fister, the high rye bourbon is my favorite. Super oaky. That bourbon has a lot of oak flavor to it. It's really nice. Um, okay. Oh, Laura, you did a super chat. Uh, finally made it. I'll rewatch this. Thank you. You, Lori, thank you so much for your super chat. You're so sweet. Uh, you may have jumped in right as I was answering your question. Um, we were talking about that. So you might've jumped in while I was talking about you. So uh, anyway, the point, did I finish my point of answering your question? Um, yeah. So, so the point is Lori, that if the hot hide is, if the top of the hot hide is 91 or 92, that's no problem. And if inside the hide, it's like 88, that's no problem. You know? So it doesn't have to be super exact. I think that Marie and Darwin are going to be happy with their new uh, new enclosures. Okay, so here is here's Paul's. Okay, so so Paul asked this question and then I answered it because I wasn't thinking. <laughs> Sometimes you know I I ask for people to to put their questions in on on Patreon before before doing a live stream and. Um, then I don't see what people are commenting on. So Paul had this question, so I just answered it for him. But it's a good question for you guys to uh, to hear. So I'll tell you what my answer was also. He says, I finally got my new hatchling to eat his first meal for me. Well done. Um, my question, what would your next steps be? A few live rat pinkies to get a, a few meals in him. Try a mouse next. How long before trying frozen thawed, mouse or rat? Thanks. Okay. Um, so here's what I said. I said, that's great. I'd keep him on rats. No need to switch to mice. If he already took a rat, uh, I don't know how big he is, but pinkies are usually a bit small. Most hatchlings will do fine with a rat pup. Uh, you also got a better feeding response. You'll also get a better feeding response with a pup. That's, uh, I'd give him a live pup for the next two or three feedings, then start offering furrows and thawed once his feed response is more immediate. So yeah, the thing is there, there is, um, there's a little bit more nutrition in rats than in mice for ball pythons. And once a ball python gets to be this size, a jumbo mouse, the biggest mouse you can find is too small for, for a snake this size. So, uh, you want them on rats. Ideally, if, if you can get them on rats was my, was my point, um, that I was making to Paul, but it sounds like his snake is doing very well. Um, Uh, okay. So learning with Lilith asks, what would you advise for a particularly inquisitive snake that, that ignores meals in preference of exploring? My girl is currently grounded since having a taste of free roaming and she's lost interest in eating in favor of trying to come out to explore. Yeah, that happens sometimes with snakes. I mean, it, it happens more with hatchlings where they kind of will ignore the food and they'll try to crawl up onto the tongs. Um, and it's a tough one. It's, it's, um, it, it may not be that they want to free roam, that they're interested in exploring. It might be kind of a stress response and they're not, and, and they're not happy with something. Uh, it might be, I'm not saying that it is for sure, but it, but it could be, you know, anytime that they do something like that, it could be a stress response. And so I would just make sure that there's plenty of clutter 
in the enclosure and keep trying to offer food. Um, if they're trying to come out every time, I wouldn't let them out at that time. Like when you have food and, and you're trying to feed them, I wouldn't let them come out to explore at that time. I, if they don't take the food, I'd put them back in and close the thing. Uh, you want to, you want to establish that, that if you're letting them out to explore, you're doing that at a time where food is not being offered. So, um, anyway, yeah, that's the challenge. It's just one of those things where you just have to keep offering. You know, I've, I go through that challenge with some hatchlings occasionally. Uh, KT asks, would you ever buy a different reptile, like a black dragon that was on your shoulder that I have a video on my, uh, on my Instagram, you guys of, of me playing with a black dragon. I, I gave Patreon a, a longer version of that video. Um, anyway, uh, would you ever buy a different reptile, like a black dragon that was on your shoulder? And if so, would you change the name of your channel? Uh, yes, I would. Because um, some of you might know that that throughout the course of my life, I've I've almost always had reptiles, and they were usually lizards of some sort. So I am a lizard guy. The reason that I have snakes is because snakes are totally happy if I leave for a week and go do gigs. Um, they're happy to be fed and have fresh water. I've got I have Lucy that comes in every three or four days if I'm if I'm on the road for an extended period of time. To give them water and that's great but any lizard needs to be fed every day and um so i don't have lizards just for that reason but there are so many that i love and so many that i would want to have and um right now i only have pythons that could change in the future you know maybe i'll end up with something else a, a boa amy benzie is um working on breeding her her uh amazon tree bo boas and I'd love to have one of those babies. Uh, but, and, and no, the, um, I, I wouldn't change the name of the channel. It would, I think it would always be green room pythons, but we would just add the other stuff to it. You know, we, I'd, I'd talk about what I have. Uh, but I like pythons and there's, there's more than just three species that I have. And you know, there's, there's a lot of species that I could, that I could get. Uh, oh, that's that. Let me just catch these. Uh, Kimber uh, says, you cracked the code. I'm the, I'm the patron who asked about my friend's cohab balls. One hadn't eaten in months. So this was a situation, if I remember right, Kimber, you were babysitting for two ball pythons that were being cohabitated and it wasn't eating. Uh, and I said, this is touchy because it's not her snakes. But I was like, separate them and see what happens. So she says, I, I separated them and two weeks later she ate. Thank you for saving the sweet python. That's great. That's fantastic. Yeah, you guys, that's the thing with cohab is a lot of times it works for a long time and it's like, oh yeah, it's no problem to cohab ball pythons because it works. It only works until it doesn't work. And um, a lot of people have seen those uh, those s snakes that, you know, there's there's photos online. You don't have to go looking it up, but there's photos online of like a one ball python that's eaten another one. They were cohabbed and all of a sudden there's a problem. And uh, so that, um, that can happen. My phone's ringing. Hang on. Hey, Yoli, I'm doing a live stream right now. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. Bye. Okay. All right. Bye. <laughs> you guys, Yoli's my neighbor and uh, one of my closest friends. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, she was probably trying to invite me over for dinner. Um, what was I saying? I completely forgot. Sorry. Somebody, somebody put it in the chat what I was talking about so I can finish my thought. Um, we were talking about the snakes that were, that were cohabbed. Yes. Oh yeah. It was just that, that, um, uh, so yeah, don't cohab these snakes. There's not many species that, that are good with cohabbing. If you want to cohab snakes, get yourself some garter snakes. They're delightful and you can throw a whole bunch of them into a big enclosure and it's great. But with pythons, 
um, they do not do well with being cohabbed. And, and the thing is in the wild there, especially now there's some new research, uh, suggesting that, that pythons, like many of them will sometimes come together for a certain portion of the year. Uh, and that's a thing that they do. But when you cohab them in an enclosure, they don't have a way to get away from one another. And, and one on one side of the enclosure and another on the other side of the, enclo the enclosure is not far enough away. They still smell each other. They, they still, it still stresses them out. And, um, uh, a lot of people think, you know, they'll say, oh, my, my snakes, I cohab them and they cuddle all the time. They're best friends. And that is not cuddling. They're, what they're doing is they're trying to thermoregulate. And, you know, if you have two snakes in a tank and there's one part of the tank that makes one of the snakes kind of cold, there's a good chance that that other snake is also going to be kind of cold. So they're both going to go over to the heat at about the same time and they'll sit there jostling for position. So what looks like cuddling is actually them just subtly trying to move each other back and forth and it's stress. So that's a stressful thing for them. So uh, it is it is good not to cohab them. Um, anyway, uh, I can't find that comment, but um, I'm so glad that that snake is, is doing well in eating. That's great. That's a good example of that. That snake hadn't eaten in months and uh, she separated them and then it ate. So uh, the, the presence of another snake was stressing that one out enough to not eat for months. Um, and it probably, it's probably lived with that other snake for a very long time and did really well up until a few months ago. So that is the thing. Snakes can establish sort of a pattern and a, a, like a pattern of behavior, but you can't expect them to always exhibit that same pattern of behavior. They change often. Um, okay, so now I'm cruising down here. I'm going to get back to the Patreon questions. Um, here's a great question. Amy, that is the inspector. I'm glad you're on here right now and not dancing. Yeah, the inspector's out. You'll have to, you'll have to watch the the whole thing about that. He actually seems to be doing okay, you guys. I thought that he might start freaking out and trying to battle me if I brought him out, but he's just on my hat. And I'm going to let him do that for a while. We'll see how this goes. Okay. Back to... Oh, geez. I gotta, I gotta have a hand on him. This is crazy. Sorry, buddy. I'm sorry. I just freaked you out by putting my hand right on your head. I'm watching myself in on the video monitor and it's reversed. And so I can't aim things. Hi buddy. Sorry about that, pal. You're not trying to be in my arms. I know. I know, but let's just do it for a little bit. Okay. Uh, all right. Where are we at? Oh, I was answering the question if I would ever buy a, another reptile like a black dragon. I, I love black dragons and, oh, I was blocking my light. I see what happened there. Uh, I love black dragons. I love Chinese water dragons are fantastic, but they need a massive enclosure and they need a huge water feature. So the unfortunate thing is people buy them because they're so cool looking and they're super cute and they're like this big, but they don't realize that this big gets eight feet long and potentially 150 pounds. So a, a Chinese water dragon is just a, even though, yes, if I could find a house to live in where I had a whole massive room that I could keep a Chinese water dragon, I, I definitely would be into that. But I think most people in the United States that have a Chinese water dragon are probably not keeping them properly. It's, it's a massive, massive endeavor, but, um, yeah, um, rhino iguanas, I love. I'd love to have a rhino iguana. There's so many. So I love reptiles. I, there's so many that I would that I would keep. Uh, but right now, it's just pythons because I'm out of town a lot. And they don't mind. You don't mind, right, buddy? You don't mind if I'm out of town a lot. Yeah, you don't want. You'd rather me not be here at all, huh? But guess where your food comes from? Me. Yeah, you don't even know. Okay, um, where are we at here?
Okay, uh, Rakawan is a new Patreon subscriber and uh, came with some good questions. Do you ever plan or would you want to breed other types of snakes slash reptiles? If so, which ones? Yes, I would. Um, I'll, I'll probably end up doing other types of pythons for now. Um, I think that I would want to do ones that are that are more rare maybe or harder to breed. And also, like, for instance, a Chinese water dragon, like a black dragon. I'd love to have one. I don't think that I would be into breeding them because uh, even though I could find homes for them all, it, it's so tough to find a good home. It would be like breeding a mainland reticulated python. It's easy to find somebody who will buy it, who will buy a baby. But are they going to be able to keep that baby when they've potentially overfed it and it's grown to a massive size? Um I don't think all mainland retics grow to massive sizes or they, sh they shouldn't necessarily, but a lot of times they're overfed and, and if they're overfed, they absolutely do grow to massive sizes. So, um, so yeah, there's, uh, there, yes, I, I would like to, to try breeding some others, but, um, right now, uh, ball pythons and, I'm going to, I'm going to try to breed those, um, super dwarves who somebody, one of those might come out later on in the live stream. And, uh, I'm looking, looking forward to breeding a black headed Python when the time comes for that. All right. Uh, next question. I want to get a good four by two by two enclosure for my ball Python. He is young right now but I want to set his up early. What company who makes these types of enclosures would you recommend? Uh, many of you might know what I'm about to say. Uh, Black Box Enclosures is who I would recommend, not only because they are a channel sponsor, but also because before they were a channel sponsor, that's who I bought enclosures from. And they're fantastic. They're, they keep their margins low, so they're really well-priced. And if you use the code GRP when ordering, you get 5% off, um, which is a pretty good deal for a company that keeps their margins low. PVC is very expensive and those are, those are expensive enclosures to make, but, uh, they do really well. They've got, they've got a great quality product and they're nice people. They might be in the, uh, Clint might be in the chat right now. I don't know. I haven't seen him, but he usually is. So if Clint's on here or if he jumps in later, you can ask him questions. Uh, next one. I've heard some other keepers say they have noticed some ball Python morphs being pickier eaters than others. Have you seen this? Is it true or false? You know, I, I don't think it's true. I, I have heard people say that pides are not good eaters. I ha I only have three that I can, that, that I can, uh, I mean, I guess I've got some hats, I guess, but as far as visual pides, I have three. Two of them are great eaters and one is not. Uh, you know, they say that spiders are great eaters. The spider morph is a really good eater, people say. Um, I I don't know. I don't know if there's any truth to... I do think that there's truth to the, to the fact that spiders are, are great eaters because everybody says that and they also have the most challenge when, when eating. Like... Um, uh, they sometimes, depending on how, how strong their wobble is, sometimes they have a hard time targeting their food. Uh, but yet they, they eat really well. So, um, okay. So there's that one. Let's just get through a couple of these and then I'll go back to the chat. I have a corn. Uh, so this is, for, this one's from kale. I have a corn snake and I was wondering if you could talk about humidifiers and how they keep how you keep snakes humid in an extremely dry environment. I've been looking into large capacity humidifiers for the room as well as hoping that would help too. Uh, I miss the enclosure every day, but it fluctuates from 20 to 80%. Yeah. So first of all, um, I don't recommend humidifiers for an enclosure. I, um, humidifiers for your room. If you can buy a humidifier for your room, those, uh, those are good. I have, I have one that I use occasionally. It's a switch bot humidifier. And it works really well. You just put water in it once a week or so, depending on how much it's being used. Um, mine isn't used very often. 
Like right now it's 51%. I'm in Los Angeles and this is supposed to be a desert, but it's 51% humidity in here. Um, uh, one thing you said in here is that you spray every day or where is it? I, I miss the enclosure every day, but it fluctuates from 20 to 80. Yeah. The reason is that, that when you missed, it becomes 80% humidity. And as soon as that all evaporates off of the substrate that you just misted, it drops it right back down to 20%. What you need to do is mix water into the substrate, mix it all up in there. And that will hold your humidity for a long time. Um, I add water. I would say for the most part, once a week to maybe once every week and a half, and I'm mixing it into the substrate. So, uh, that's the thing to do. Misting, misting, just it, it gets your humidity up for the time being, but it evaporates very quickly. So mix it into that substrate. Look at the inspector. He's so crazy. I'm going to put him back in a minute. He's doing really well though. Like he's not trying to fight me. He's not being combative. He's, he's, uh, he's a little bit like, I can tell he's a little bit on edge when I'm holding him. He's a little, he's a little tense. Um, and he isn't, that's not the way, you know, some snakes always are, but he's not really like that when he's not in breeding season but he's not trying to fight me right now. And it is common for him to be trying to fight me when I, when I pull him out. Uh, so he's, he's having a good day today. All right. Next question from Kale. Uh, let's see. I'm going to put a hand on the inspector real quick. Try and do this so I don't freak him out. Okay. Uh, all right. Next question from Kale. When you talk about socializing with your animal by just putting your hand in their enclosure, and just sitting there, do you expose the snake first by removing the hide so it can see your hand and know you're there? Or do you just place your hand in the enclosure and leave without saying, finding it first? Um, I just really want my corn snake to eventually come straight to my hand when I come into his enclosure. Yeah, so I don't have a lot of experience with corn snakes, for one thing. But my guess is that the that the principles here are, are the same. So the only time that I'm... When I'm putting my hand into a snake's enclosure, that's like the second step in socializing a nervous snake. The first step is just sitting next to their enclosure when they're out of their hide. I'm not pulling their hide up, but when I see that they're out, I'm going to sit or stand there and, and just hang out for a while and not do anything, not even escalate that, not open their enclosure or anything. Just have them see me standing there. And, uh, you know, when sort of that, I'll closer when they're out of their hide. I'm not pulling their hide because that makes them nervous all of a sudden. You don't want to start out a session like that with a nervous snake because all of a sudden you've changed their environment. You've got to wait till they're out of their hide anyway. And some snakes don't come out of their hide very often. So it's it's kind of tricky. But if they're out of their hide, I will um, sit there next to their enclosure. And if they seem okay with that, I'll slowly open the thing. And then I'll put my hand not near them necessarily, but just in there so they can see it. Um, I think that 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 that's a good way to socialize them to where they're not scared, where they see the big scary monkey, but they also see that that big scary monkey isn't doing anything that makes them even more nervous. You know, you're not always trying to grab them when when they see you. I don't know that they'll ever get to a point where they'll come up to you. You know, um, there's often no reason for that. I mean, I have I have some ball pythons that will come up to me just because they know that that. I've opened their enclosure and they want to come out. They're not scared of me. So they come up to me because they know if they crawl onto my arm, that leads to out of their enclosure. It's not because they like me so much and they want to hang out with me. It's that I'm the ladder to get them out of their enclosure kind of. Um, so uh, that's about all you can expect from, from a snake is that they will see you as uh, somebody that, that is not threatening and they could potentially use you to get, to, to explore a little bit. Um, great question. Okay. Franca asks, what are your thoughts on nidovirus? I have now gotten to the point, uh, that I will have all my snakes tested. Uh, none display any symptoms. Hang on. Obviously doing this one handed. Uh, but as infected animals can be asymptomatic, I just want to have some peace of mind. Hey, what are you? Oh, come on, dude. Seriously. You guys hang on. I got to fight with him really quick. Oh, 
love you, crazy snake. I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't paying attention. All right, we got him. I won the fight. I won the battle, didn't I? Sorry, pal, you can't be on there. Uh, okay, so um, she says, I, I just want to have some peace of mind. Uh, actually, I'm quite scared of the results. Yeah, so NIDA virus is a very scary virus in in that that happens in pythons and it's not curable and uh it's highly contagious so you do not want nido virus in your collection there's a lot of talk about it especially with people who keep lots of snakes um i'm on to the bourbon by the way now i'm gonna put this crazy guy back here in a minute um so nido virus is a big problem uh but it's not as common as it would seem with so much talk about it. So if you just have a handful of snakes, you're probably okay, but it's, it's good to get them tested, you know? Um, uh, especially a snake that, that seems to always come down with a respiratory infection. That's potentially a sign um, of, of nidovirus. Nidovirus is something that a snake can have for a very long time and doesn't show signs of anything. But what it'll do is it'll cause a respiratory infection and then the snake dies of that. So it's not that they're dying from nidovirus. They're dying from, from something that uh, that I think I heard somewhere that it's related to COVID, not nidoviruses. Don't quote me on that because I might be wrong, but I think it is. Um, but it's not something that humans can get. So don't worry about that. Uh, but so I guess I guess my point is that it is a legitimate concern and... Uh, I will probably get all my snakes tested at some point, although I haven't yet, uh, just, just for the peace of mind, but it's not a, as much as it's talked about, it seems like it's a lot more common than, than I think it is. So, all right, pal, I'm going to put you back. Hold on a sec. Let me put him back. Let's get you in here. He started getting real wily. He did really well, though. He did way better than I expected for bringing him out. Uh, I don't spend, like right now during breeding season, I don't bring him out and spend time with him like I just did. That's a that's not a common thing. I bring him out, put him in his girlfriend's tub, then put him back. And that's pretty much all I do with him because he doesn't want, like he's not trying to hang out with me. So he actually did pretty well. Um Okay, you guys run the last page. Yeah, we're on the last page of these. So Natalie asks, I've no uh, have you noticed any major differences in personality based on ball python age? At six months old, my little guy is suddenly super adventurous and curious. I even caught him climbing the other night, which was awesome to see. Maybe he's grown out of a cautious baby stage. Yeah, he probably has. Um, yes, this is this is something to think about. Um, you know, a lot of times people observe their snake for a while and they go, this is my snake's personality. This is what they do. And in their mind, that's how the snake always is their whole life. But snakes really change their their personalities as they grow. Like things, things change and they change. You, you can never accept, expect them to act the same way all the time because they will change and they'll have a tendency to do something for a long time. And then all of a sudden that won't be the tendency anymore. And, uh, so it's, it's, it's really important to just keep an eye on your snake and notice what they're actually really doing. Even if you have decided that they're like this, they're not going to be like that all the time. So, um, Oh, what happened here? The browser lost connection with my camera. Hang on. Let me see if I can fix this, you guys. Hold on. Well, that's annoying. 
hang on a second. Uh, okay, guys, hold on. Let me see if I can figure this out. Oh, look at that. I don't know what that was. I don't know what happened. But we're back, right? Will somebody confirm that that we're back and you can see me? It looks like we lost audio. Oh, welcome back. Okay, thanks, Kayla. Appreciate it. Okay. I don't know what that was. That was crazy. That's never happened before. I hope I hope things are good. Uh great. Thanks for thanks for sticking with me. We still have we still have almost 90 people in the live and I just went dead and you guys you guys stayed with me that's really nice I appreciate it um okay where were we at on this so yeah so, yeah I was just talking about yeah so expect your your snake to do different things they're they're not always going to do the same thing look at the inspector he's going to be like that all night now now that I pulled him out he's going to be a little bit crazy um I don't think I'm trying to think if I can put him in with somebody right now, but it's, it's not time yet. He's got a few weeks to go before he visits another girlfriend. Uh, he's, he's being paired in case you're curious, he's being paired right now with Lucille and, uh, Damara. Is that it? Yeah. Lucille and Damara right now. We'll see how that, we'll see how that goes. All right. Now we're into the Harper's questions, you guys. I better take a drink for this one. The Harpers always have the most creative questions. Mm. That is delicious bourbon. Okay. This is what it is. It's the JJ Fister straight bourbon whiskey. Oh, but you know what? You can't get this bottling because this was one of the ones. This is batch number one bottle number 138. I think this is one of the ones that the manager of the distillery uh, gave me. They had like six left, I think. So I don't know that this one's available, but all their stuff is delicious. Super oaky, that one. All right. Uh, let's see. So Harper's, I should have figured out what my answers were going to be before, but I didn't. So the Harper say, as an actor, if you could choose to play any role in any form of production, stage, film, TV, radio, et cetera, what would it be? You know, I like the stability of a TV show that's on for a long time. So if I knew that it was going to be a show that was going to be a long lasting show, I'd say like some character on a sci-fi show. I don't want to necessarily be on a sitcom Although sitcoms are fine, I'd be happy with that. But if I had my choice, it'd be like some cool sci-fi show and I'd be the the funny tech guy or whatever. Um, or the weird bearded hillbilly guy on a show like that. Um, like like an alien on, on the Orville or something. Uh, all right. I like movies too. Movies are cool. If freed of the financial responsibilities that make paid work a necessity, how would you like to spend your days? You know, uh, probably traveling. I'd probably, I'd probably be, probably be traveling a lot. Yeah, I'd still have animals. I mean, I do. I pretty much paid work is a necessity, but I've made it so that everything I do for paid work is stuff that I love doing. So it may not be much different than, than what I already do. Um, do you guys see the crazy spam block user? So I did this last time. Oh, good. That got rid of all of them. Okay. Uh, next one from the Harpers. We have heard your voiceovers for Ron Freya and detective inspector Rorschach. In previous videos, how did you come up with those voices for their characters? Uh, I came up with that vo those voices probably three seconds before the camera rolled and uh, didn't think much about them. 
<laughs> and so they continue to say, following on from the previous question, do you have any vocal characteristics in mind for any of your other snakes? Should they need voiceovers in the future? I do plan on doing more of that in the future. And no, I have nothing in mind. They'll probably end up sounding like the other voiceovers that I've done with the other snakes. Uh, Cause I kind of don't think about it before I do it. Um, the ones, those are kind of older videos and I really like them. They're, it's, they're funny where I do the voiceovers. Uh, but I didn't really think much about those, those voices. Um, I think I'm going to have to put some thought into it though for the next one. So they don't sound exactly alike, but we'll see. Those are fun to do. How is little B Arthur Dent getting on? That is, let's see. Oh, she's, she's actually, let me show her because she's up and moving around right now. There's 90 people in the chat. I'd like to uh, send out a personal thank you to the person who most recently joined the live stream to make it 90. Oh, now we have 88. Dang it. We just lost two. So I did something that wasn't interesting and we lost, we lost two people. We need to get it back up to 90. Call your friends, you guys. Hey there, young lady. Oh, look at you coming right out. Okay, so this is a shy little snake, although she just came right out onto my hand, which she does occasionally. I don't know that she understands what she's doing when she does that, though. So this is little B. Arthur Dent. The Patreon supporters named her. She just went through a bad shed, and she has some stuck shed on her neck, but I'm choosing not to stress her out with trying to pick that off or trying to soak her or anything. Cause she's got enough issues. So <laughs> I'm just leaving it. Uh, she's fine. It'll, it'll come off. The rest will come off on her next shed, but, um, she's doing okay. She's being assist fed. And for those of you who don't know, she was born with a little, I'm going to see if I can show it in camera. I think I have to be off camera for it to focus on her, but she has a little dent on the side of her head and it's not that it's the other side. Wait, it's that side. You can see it on kind of the back of her back of her head. It's just dented in a little bit. It's she's lacking that muscle. I think there's there's a muscle right there right there and I think she just doesn't have that muscle. And um she's she's a little bit wonky that way. She's, uh she's got a she's got a wonky jaw a little and she always like thanks. Um being assist fed and She's, you know, now I am trying to work off this. <laughs> her stuck shed is bugging me, so I am going to do this while I'm holding her. Um, she's being assist fed, and when I put food in her mouth, she is able to swallow it on her own. So I think that she's a good candidate for thriving eventually once she figures out how to take meals on her own. But I think she just needs to gain a little bit of size and confidence um, because right now she's not taking meals on her own. And uh, this is just on, I think she might've got her head or maybe not. Maybe she didn't get her head. It's what, you know, sometimes you got to make decisions. Is it, is it better to soak her and put her through all that stress or not soak her, but like put her in a, you know, I could put her in like a humid hide or something and keep her in there for a few hours, try to get the shed off or just leave it on and it'll be taken care of next, next shed. Uh, she is a special case. So any other snake, I would definitely work to get this off, but it's fine. She's okay. Anyway, she is, uh, I think she's doing fine. She's just going to be slower than, than most of the snakes at, uh, she's strong. She's inquisitive and, and curious. She is very frightened. Anytime I try to offer her food, whether it's frozen thought or live, I've offered both and she's very scared of her food. So, um, she gets assist fed and it's not at like, like right now I'm giving her two weeks in between assist feedings and then I'll try to offer her another meal. And, um, uh, I will, I'll probably leave a, a frozen thought in there all night and see if she'll take it. I doubt that she will, but I want to, I want to give her the opportunity. And then, uh, if I need to, I'll assist feed again. So. That is how little B. Arthur Dent is doing. Her name, you guys, the, the Patreon supporters named her Arthur Dent. B. 
because she has a dent on the side of her head. And Arthur Dent is the character in uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So her name was Arthur Dent. But then when we when I sexed my these snakes and realized that she was a female, we named her B. Arthur. After. B. Arthur, the national treasure. Um, so her name is B. Arthur Dent. That's that. I'm going to put her back because I don't want to stress her out much. I don't handle her a lot because she's she's a special case. All right. She's cute. I, th I think she's going to do well. It's going to take a while, though. I think I'm probably going to have to assist feed her for, for a while. She's got to grow a bit. Normally, you assist feed very small meals, like, like little tiny um, hopper mice. And uh, I've, I've been bumping up the size a little bit, get, trying to give her larger meals that aren't going to stress her out. But I want her to grow a bit. I think that's part of her thing is she, she just needs to, to grow a little bit to gain some confidence. Um, okay. So there's that. You guys, we might be on the last Patreon question and then I'm jumping into the chat. Uh, again, if you have a question, have I missed any super chats by the way? Has anybody noticed? If you've got a question that you definitely want me to see, super chat it. I don't think I have. There was there was a handful of them in the beginning of the thing. We got Lori's. Okay, I think I got all those. Flag me though, you guys, if it looks like I'm missing a super chat. Okay, last question from the Harpers. Should you catch a snake going into a confined space that they shouldn't be entering and they already have got their head and neck in such a position as to prevent you from simply pulling them out without risk of injuring them. Is there a recommended way of getting them to reverse their tracks? Yeah, that's tough. Um, you know, let me think about this. Oftentimes it's, you know, if they're, if they're way far in there, you just have to let them get in there and then you have to work on getting them out. Um, but if it's just their head and neck, a lot of times you can, you can sort of manage their body hand over hand and try to just pull a little bit and wet and wedge them out like that a little bit. But sometimes it's better to cut your losses and let them go. And then, and then, uh, figure out how to move that piece of furniture safely or whatever, uh, whatever they're in. Now, if they're going into a wall, a hole in the wall. You can't let them go. You got, you got to just tire them out. Keep them, you know, keep them there. Don't let them get further into the wall. So depending on what, what they're crawling into, you know, but you will, you can, uh, you can tire them out. So that's the thing that, you know, you just sit there and work with them and work them and work them. And eventually they'll let go. Um, good eye, Lori 95. That's right. We got 95 people on. Oh, now we're in 97. Thanks you guys. Those of you who are just now jumping in, feel free to say hello. There's a lot of friendly people in the chat right now. If you've just jumped in, feel free to say hello to the folks in the chat. And, uh, okay. So that was, that was it for the Patreon. Um, for the, the Patreon questions. In fact, let's, since, since we've done that, let's do this. Um, okay. I'm going to get back to that in just a second. The, these are the horde of keepers, uh, on Patreon. And, you know, I do this Patreon scroll all the time. And I think a lot of people don't quite understand what it is. And really it's just, um, it's a separate site, patreon.com. And it's a situation where you can sign up it's a it's a monthly subscription fee and there's there's different fees that you know different people get different things um everybody gets acknowledged on the patreon scroll but you'll notice that that the writing is different for for different levels um and then they get you know from like for me they get different um some people get t-shirts some people get sticker packs some get both they all get extra videos i try to post interesting videos for them uh, 
exclusive Patreon videos. And uh, this, so at the at the five dollar a month level, you get almost everything. I mean, you don't you don't get the physical perks, you don't get the sticker packs and stuff like that, but you get all the videos and and you get to be in the horde of keepers and the the Discord. There's a special thing on Discord. Uh, Rosie here is the um, is the newest member. That's Rosie. If I if I have this right, Rosie is Paul Sybil's granddaughter. I think. Am I right about that, Paul? Oh, I said it wrong. It's Paul Seibel. Um, I've been saying Sybil in my brain ever since he signed up, but I now know that it's Seibel. Paul Seibel. Anyway, I think that's Paul Seibel's granddaughter, maybe. And look at our channel sponsor, Black Box Cages, who I was just talking about. Is Clint in the chat? I don't think so. I don't think I've seen him in, although I haven't been looking at the chat for a while, but, um, all right. So if you, all right, so I'm going to just scroll up the chat a little bit. And what I'm looking for is people that have maybe written my name in bold, because that is how I will know that it's a question for me. Um, if I accidentally miss you, I'm sorry about that. Also, you can uh, you can super chat, and I'll see that. Catherine Scott, hi Bob. This is my first time catching a live stream. Oh, good. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. I went from being terrified of snakes my whole life to getting two ball pythons. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Now I'm taking classes to become a mentor in a ball python group. That's fantastic. Congratulations. So cool. I love when people get over their fear of snakes. I love that. That's great. Uh, all right. So that was a while back. Um, keep scrolling down, looking. Wait, let's do it this way. I don't want to spend a ton of time just standing here sitting here staring at the screen but <laughs> so this is how far back i am danielle said bob turned into a snake logo so that was so i'm all the way back to when my video cut off that was a that was a long time ago uh let's see okay all the technical difficulties are back now you guys are talking amongst yourselves. I love that there's, you know, like I'm doing my thing here, but then you guys have a whole other world going on in the chat. And I love that. It's such a cool little community going on here on the YouTubes. Erica, you're right. I do need another snake companion. You see how I saw that, you guys? It says at Bob. Um, let me grab another snake. Hang on. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. In fact, who do you guys want to see? Give me a um, Give me a suggestion. Robert, this is a great question. Bob, did you ever get that D and D game going? Uh, we are going to do that. This is sort of a Patreon question because there's there's a D and D game that's going to happen. It was supposed to happen last month, and I need to get with the dungeon master who is in England uh, and see what his timing is because um, that is in the works. We were the the plan was to do it last month, and I think things just got away from us. So it is happening. Um, and it'll be the first of, of potentially many D&D &D games on Patreon with uh, 
it actually will be over discord but but it's with the patreon folks um Oh, okay. We got we got people suggest asking now. Uh, okay, the first the first request is for Kata. So we'll get Kata, and then um, and then we'll go down the list. We'll see, we'll see what we can do here. Let's see what let's see what mood Kata's in. I mean, Kata's moods don't change very often. Her mood is always just a little bit nervous. Just a little nervous. I'm glad that we checked on her, though, because she has spilled a lot of water in there. And uh, I need to dry things out. A little water spiller today. This is a sweet snake who uh, just was not socialized as a youngin, And I got her... I got her after she was a few years old. I think she was maybe five when I brought her in. Look at this. you got water all over you. You recently dumped your water. I can tell you were all wet. Um, and I think she's getting a little bit more used to, used to things. You know, used to me. Stuff like that. She's cool. Hopefully she, uh, she's paired with Ron this season. And I think she's, I think she's building follicles. I haven't seen a ton of like bowl soaking from her and stuff like that. So I'm not sure what's going on, but she's paired with Ron and she is a super yellow belly. So that's an ivory. She's an ivory and she's supposed to be GHI. Um, I certainly paid for that extra GHI gene, but I'm not super confident that she is. So we'll see. But uh, the idea is that Ron has asphalt in him and she has two copies of yellow belly. So they'll make some freeways, uh, possibly GHI freeways. And Ron also has inchy and, uh, spot nose. So they should make some interesting stuff. Um, and look at this. I mean, she's, she's pretty, she's not too nervous. If Amy was here right now, she tends to not be nervous at all when Amy holds her. So she particularly likes Amy. And uh, she's she's doing good with... Maybe she, I'm Amy. So we got... We got a, a number of requests for, for Kata. And then we've got some Tiger Lily requests. So we'll do that. We'll see... Uh, Echo and Stella, we'll see how they're doing. Nighttime's a little sketchy for those two, uh, especially Echo. Stella has never Stella's never bit me, which I'm surprised because she sometimes seems like she's going to. Echo gets a little food crazy, but they are growing fast. You might be surprised if I if I'm able to pull one of them out. You might be surprised at their size because they're they're both in a growth spurt, and I've been I've been feeding them more, um, not more often, but bigger meals. Let's um, tell you what, let me do this. Let me see how Miss Kata will do around my neck. Sometimes she does okay and sometimes not so much. So we'll just see how this goes. And then uh, let's get, let's get Tiger Lily. My guess is I haven't seen Tiger Lily all day since, since this morning when I checked th on them, but I'm going to guess that I'm going to be, coming back here with a whiskey sleeve in my hand and tiger lily inside it. That's my guess. Let's see if I'm right. Hey, you. I mean, technically I'm right, but she is half out of her whiskey sleeve. So <laughs> she... She was sitting there like this. And actually, you guys, um, let's focus on Tiger Lily here. I'm going to put Kata back. And I'll tell you why in just a second. 
She well, I'll tell you why right now. She just shed, but she didn't poop when she shed. So and she shed this morning. So my guess is she's got a massive poop coming, and I don't want to be under it. So let me put her back really quick, and then we'll, we'll look at how how cute is this little snake, right? All right, Kata. You crazy girl. Ugh. All right. So here is a snake in a whiskey sleeve. If you follow me on Oh, do we have a bunch of substrate with us also? If you follow me on Instagram, you'll see a lot of little silly videos. But I posted a video about how she blends perfectly with the inside of this. Come on, can I just pull you out, please? Ugh. Come on. Crazy snake. See the inside of this thing? She blends perfectly with it. There we go. Is that substrate? Yes, it is. All right. All right, young lady, we got you. We got you out of your whiskey sleeve. She's doing well. She's uh, not, she hasn't eaten in a while. She was the strongest eater for a very long time. And then she kind of hit a wall. So she's taken, um, I don't know, maybe a month since she, since she ate, which is not a, not a big concern. She's just, she's just taking a break. And uh, I'm going to offer, actually, I think I'm offering her food maybe tonight, maybe, or maybe tomorrow, something like that. But, uh, but that's okay. I don't mind it. She ate heavily um, up and up until then from, from day one, up until she decided to start refusing. She ate pretty heavily. So I don't mind that. That's okay. It is, uh, my guess is that it's probably pretty healthy for a snake to take time off of, of food um, occasionally. I don't think that a, a meal a week, a, you know, a big meal a week every week for a ball python is is healthy. Uh, you end up with snakes like Kata. Actually, Kata is looking a little bit better, but um, she's an overweight snake. She came to me very overweight. Uh, she She came to me looking like how a gravid ball python should look, you know. A lot, lot of extra fat, but also full of eggs, but she wasn't full of eggs. And so uh, once snakes get obese like that, it's hard to, to get them to lose weight. And with Kata, I don't necessarily want her to lose weight because she's breeding. So she'll lose when she goes off food and she's developing those eggs. That's the time that she'll lose the fat. Uh, but anyway, the point is that I don't, I don't want to necessarily make my snakes like that. And, uh, you know, I want tiger Lily to be up to breeding size when she's ready, but I don't want her to be an obese snake. Otherwise I want her to be, be able to breed, have enough excess fat to, to weather those months when she'll be off food because she's breeding, but she doesn't need to be massively fat. Otherwise, you know, she doesn't need to look like a blood Python, um, which is a cool snake, but they're short and very fat. So. This is Tiger Lily. She's doing good. We'll see if I can get her to eat something this week. Um, here's a good question. Daniel, uh, hi, Bob. Tips for going to my first expo. Um, yeah, tips for your first expo, I would say, um, go there with the mindset that you're not necessarily, so uh, the, the problem with, the problem with some people at expos is that they will impulse buy an animal and, and no animal should be impulse bought. And an expo is great for impulse buying stuff. So if you plan to buy something, 
get it in your head what you're looking for and what you're willing to pay for it. Don't just go there with a ton of money burning a hole in your pocket. And then you come back with some animal that you now have to feverishly look up the husbandry parameters for. Um, uh, so I would say that. And uh, if you have other, if, if you have other animals uh, or other snakes and you go to a reptile expo and you handle some snakes, just make sure that you, when you come home, throw those clothes in the, in the wash and take a shower before you handle your animals because you could come home with mites. Um, so I'm always careful about that. Whenever I come home from a, from an expo, I go straight to the shower and get rid of those clothes that I was in at the expo. Um, cause you never know what has mites and I like to handle snakes at expos. Okay, I think I'm really, I think I'm really backed up. Let's see. I'm just trying to catch up a little bit. Yeah, Michael, Kata uh, is an ivory. She is a black-eyed leucistic. And that's, that's what an ivory is, is black-eyed leucistic. Um, or leucistic, if you want to say it right. Um, I toyed with pronouncing it correctly for a while, and then I was like, I just can't do it. I hear people say leucistic so much that that seems like the right way to say it, and that's how I'm going to say it, even though technically that's not the right way to say it. Sven, this is a great question, and I wish I had done this sooner. Uh, Sven is asking, we do Europe friendly streams in the future time wise. <laughs> yes, I have, I've planned on doing them and I haven't done them yet. I've dropped the ball on those plans. Uh, but you know, for those of you in Europe right now that are, that are up at whatever it is, 2 AM or whatever time it is in your time zone and you're up watching this, uh, really appreciate it. I'm glad that you've joined us. And, uh, I know that this is not a friendly time for you. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to figure that out. We're, we're going to do that. I got to, I got to put that back on my list and make that a plan so that we can get more people from Europe watching videos. Okay. Scrolling down. All right. So, um, Natty's garden is asking if tiger Lily has green eyes. Yes, she does. Uh, hey, young lady, she kind of, they, right now they look yellow to me, but yeah, she has light eyes. Let me see if I can move out of the cam. I, I doubt the camera is going to be able to show you the color of her eyes, but we're going to try it. She has cool eyes. Hey, can we? Uh, maybe, maybe you got a shot of it. I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to tell. But yeah, she has very light. They're kind of they're kind of golden yellow, actually. Maybe it's just in this light right now. But yeah, she's got the inchy eyes. Inchy inchy typically gives them green eyes. Um, Tiger Lily is uh, Sven. Tiger Lily is a year old. She's just over a year old. And you know what I should do, you guys, is bring Dolly out as well so we can compare sizes. Because for those of you who've been with me since they were hatched, if you remember, Tiger Lily was the last one to crawl out of, of the egg in, in the clutch. Uh, but she did pretty well eating on her own. Um, she ate, I don't, I don't remember if she ate right away or she refused her first couple meals, but she started eating normally. Whereas Dolly 
had to be assist fed. And she took, I think, three or four assist fed meals before she would eat on her own. Uh, and I probably waited a month and a half or so, maybe two months uh, of her refusing every meal, refusing, refusing, refusing until she got a fit assist fed. And now she eats really well. I haven't had them out together in a while. And I'm curious now that Tiger Lily has been skipping some meals and Dolly hasn't been skipping meals. Dolly might be bigger. Um, so we're going to eyeball it. Give me one minute. Third Gray is asking about the honey flavored wild turkey. Um, what are my thoughts? I haven't had it. I, I probably wouldn't try it on purpose. Um, I typically am not into flavored whiskeys. And uh, wild turkey is a lovely bourbon. They're, they're, uh, yeah, I mean, they've got, they've got a nice bourbon. Um, I'm not, I'm just not into the, to the flavored whiskeys as much. So, but it might be good for people that are into the flavored. Speaking of uh, whiskeys, I'm almost out of this bourbon that I'm drinking from my snake scotch cup that my neighbor Yoli got me. All right, let me grab. Um, oh, Lori's telling me that I was over 100. That's great. I'm not now. I'm at 96 now. We were over 100. Thanks for, thanks for the heads up on that. That's cool. This is, um, you know, the cool thing about, about you folks that joined the chat, joined the chats, um, you know, are in on the live stream is that, that you're very engaged and you're engaged in talking with one another, chatting with one another. And it's just a nice, highly engaged community. I, you know, I see, I see other people that do live streams where there might be a lot of people watching, but there's not nearly as much engagement. So, for some reason, it seems like the people that are watching these live streams, there's there's a higher percentage, even though I always encourage people to just put on this live stream and then go clean your snakes or whatever. Uh, but I think there's a higher percentage of people that are actually sitting there chatting with one another, watching the live stream. I think it's cool. Um, and this isn't a live, like I don't have guests on this live stream, which most most people do. So being a live stream without guests, I really appreciate your engagement. So thanks for that. Okay. Uh, let's grab, let me grab, uh, let me grab Dolly really quick. I'm going to keep Tiger Lily with me because we want, let's compare. She, Dolly definitely looks bigger to me, but it's really hard to tell when I've got one snake that's stretched out. You know what? Let's weigh him. Hold on. Watch this. We can do this really fast. I got my scale right here. Turn it on. Dolly's super easy to weigh right now because she's all curled up. 971. Dolly's 971 grams. Look at Tiger Lily on my hat. So remember that. Don't forget it. 971 for Dolly. Now I got to figure out how to weigh this snake. Okay, let's figure this out really fast. Hey, will you just curl up on this really fast? Can I get you to... I think it's going to be hard. I might have to get something else for her to sit on. 875. This one has surpassed her by 100 grams at this point. Um, again, I don't mind that, that Tiger Lily has been off food for a month or so. Um, I think that's healthy. As long as she's not perpetually off for a long time, I don't think, I don't think she will be. You never know, but um, I think it's good to take a little break for, for a while. So here are these two sisters. They're both 
super beautiful and super different looking for being sisters. So I'll just manage them with one arm, I guess, and uh, keep going through the chat. Uh, Sven says, could you keep a ball python in your living room as a display animal? Sure. All my snakes are in my living room, technically. Uh, this is, I'm sitting in, this is my living room right here. Uh, I wouldn't keep them out. If that's what you're asking, like just out roaming, I wouldn't be free roaming them all the time. Um, my, mine do free roam, but only, only at certain times. And I know where they're at and I put them away after a couple hours. Okay. All right, I'm almost at the bottom of this. Oh, this is interesting. Twisted Tink says, Wild Turkey is actually the first distillery to make a honey bourbon like 20 years ago before flavored bourbon was the end thing. You should try it at least to sample. Yeah, I should. I agree. Maybe they've, they maybe they figured out how to do it right. Um, I have tasted flavored bourbon that is not bad. That's, you know, that's pretty good. Uh, I will try Wild Turkeys though. That's interesting. Roxanne says, tomorrow was requested. All right. I'll pull Damara out for a minute. She is a mama building follicles, but uh, but I'll I'll get her out. Let me let me put these two ladies away real quick. One second, sorry for the delay. I assume you're chatting amongst yourselves. Okay, hi, I'm back. Uh, all right, let's see what Damar is up to really fast. Hey, Mama. Mama, can I just see you for a second? Oh, I know you're busy being a mama. Come see us for a minute. Okay. A lot of fans of Damara on this channel. She is a big girl. I just posted a reel on Instagram and TikTok. Um, I think I posted it on TikTok as well about her size. She's five and a half feet long and over 4,000 grams. She's a big mama. Okay. Michael, yes. Uh, Tiger Lily is inchy calico and four other jeans. She's got, she's got a lot going on. Um, and, and, uh, Dolly is also Calico with some other stuff, but Dolly's not inchy. Okay, just cruising through here. Again, if you have a question that you want me to answer, put at Bob. Don't you don't have to at me because that doesn't matter. Like I because I'm just seeing my names my name in all caps. If I see my name in all caps, if I happen to see that, then I'll then I'll answer. And uh and then if you super chat, I'll definitely see it.
Taylor, you're as tall as Damara. Well done. That's great. Taylor's 5'5", five, five, you guys. And Ava, that's right. Damara is a pinstripe. She is... She just a pinstripe. Just the one gene, and she's absolutely beautiful. And as um, socialized as you can be. Just a sweet lovely girl. She's been spending more time in her tub lately just because she's kind of nesting because she's building follicles right now. Um, she hangs out with the inspector a little bit about once, once a month or so. And, uh, you know, she's doing well. She's a big girl. I'm going to put her back though, because of that, because she's trying to be a nesting mama. Okay, beautiful girl. Okay, there you go. There you go. Okay. Rakawan says, uh, I feed my boy, uh, uh, I fed my boy yesterday and he already looks like he wants to explore tonight. Would it be safe to see if he goes into my hand and handle him for a little bit? No, I wouldn't. Uh, that's okay. They do that sometimes. They, you know, when they're digesting, uh, but you know, they'll, they'll move around a little bit. Make sure that you're feeding the appropriate size. You know, it, it could be that you fed something really small and it didn't really do much, but, uh, but also, you know, they can move around a little bit when they're trying to digest food. I'd give them at least 24 hours. Sorry, Amy, <laughs> you did miss Kata, but you won't miss her when you watch the replay. She was out. And, and the thing is, Amy, I had her out. She just shed. She's really pretty, but she just shed and she hadn't pooped yet. So I'm expecting that to show up any minute. And I didn't want it to show up while I was sitting here. That's why she's not in my hands right now. Uh, this is a good question. Do I have a favorite Australian python species? Oh, in fact, we should get out my Australian python species because she just shed also. I'm a big fan of black-headed pythons. Uh, but also in the realm of sort of the carpet pythons. Um, I like, I like jungle carpets a lot. Uh, I'm ch I've, my, my mind just went blank. Um, I can't think of the name. I will. And I'll, and I'll shout it out when I think of it, but, uh, um, love rough scale pythons. R Ruffies are super cool. I want one. I just love their story. Uh, rough scales are awesome. That, that might be my favorite just because they were just recently discovered and they only live in this very small region of the Kimberly and they have the longest teeth of any other python species and uh, they don't have a tendency to use those teeth in captivity on on their uh on the people that keep them so that's cool i like ruffies a lot uh diamond pythons that's what i was trying to think of i really like diamonds like if i if we're talking about all the different carpet python types diamond pythons are really cool Okay. I'm going to answer this one and then I'm going to get Maya. Nobody has requested Maya yet, but I'm requesting her. Uh, she just shed. She's looking good. And we'll see. I mean, it's evening. This might not be the time to be holding her, but we'll give it a try. We'll see what happens. Um, so out bad brutal says I'm going to get a Python soon and collecting all the materials I need. What is the type of F10 you use? 
I see three different types. Oh yeah, it's uh, F10. I think it's SC. Hang on, get this out of the way. Let me just look really quick. Yep, I have it just in the closet. F10 SC. I don't know what the SC stands for, but that's what you want to get. And uh, if you're in the United States, F10 is really expensive right now and hard to get. And chlorhexidine is is fine to use. Uh, all right, let's see about this crazy black-headed python. Hold on a second. Okay, I already can tell that I definitely need a hook with her right now. She is, she is looking for food. Sometimes I just reach in and pull her out with my hands. But uh, she was looking for food, so... We use a hook, and now that she's out, she shouldn't be looking for food anymore, but you never know with the snake. So we'll just see how she does. She hasn't bit me in a long time, and that's mainly because I can tell when she's ready to go for it, but when I'm holding her and on a live stream, things could things could go south but that's okay i think she's doing okay she i think that she has figured out and i can't trust this for sure but i think that maya has figured out that when she's being held she's not being fed so she's not uh she's not looking to try to bite arms now she could completely let's just see what happens here she could totally prove me wrong but I haven't been bit by her in a very long time. Um, oh, Lori. Yeah, hold on. I just lost it. Lori is asking if we can see Anya. Yes, you can see Anya. I will definitely pull her out. You guys don't let me forget to pull out Anya. That's a good idea. So Maya here is doing really well. We're working on an upgraded enclosure that black box cages will be building and sending, I think maybe in January or February and only be ready. Uh, she is, uh, eats, she eats mostly birds and uh, I have, I have iguana reptilinks that I give her. So she eats, she eats a lot of birds and iguana reptilinks and about once a month she gets a rodent. Uh, and she eats a lot more often than the other pythons she's eating, uh, once every four days about, uh, their metabolism is a lot faster than other pythons. And in the wild, they're eating a lot more often. They're, they're eating mostly reptiles and, um, just grabbing bearded dragons and other snakes and all kinds of reptiles kind of on a daily basis or maybe every other day or something. So feeding her every, every three to four days is kind of the way to go. But look how pretty she is. Look at this. This is called ladder back when, when they, you know, most black headed pythons don't have this black across their back at all. They just have stripes kind of like a Woma, but the ladder back is, uh, describes the, um, the, dark back with the little dots in there so and then this super shiny black head hey will you can we show your head young lady we show this cool black head and when she yawns you guys if you haven't spent much time around a black-headed python her mouth looks like a black mamba her mouth is all black inside her tongue is black super cool Black, black mambas, by the way, are called black mambas because the inside of their mouth is black. 
they are not a black snake. Uh, okay. Amy, this is not nice. It's not nice to laugh so hard when she proves me wrong. <laughs> that you're going to laugh when Maya bites me. <laughs> it's not nice at all. I think she's doing good. I'm now pretty confident that she won't bite me. Because I think if she was going to, she would have done it. She, the, thing with, the thing with black-headed pythons, for those of you who haven't heard me say this before, is that uh, I learned this from Derek Roddy, who's kind of the, the guy that has been breeding black-headed pythons in the United States for the longest. And uh, he told me once that black-headed pythons are not, first of all, they're not, they're not even defensive really in the wild. I've seen videos of people picking up black-headed pythons in the wild and they don't get bit. So they're not, they, they will rarely be defensive. Uh, and if they are, they do this bluff strike thing where they'll, where they'll strike with an open mouth, but, but it's just a bluff. Um, but they do often bite because they think you're food. And Derek says that it's because we teach them to eat mammals in the wild and mammals are, I mean, in captivity and mammals are not part of their normal diet. They're usually eating reptiles. And uh, so they don't really have a sense of being able to determine what's a rodent and what's a human because we're all just mammals. And so sometimes they think that humans are their food. So that's kind of crazy. such a cool different like a totally different snake if i didn't know what this was and i was just holding this and it was a snake i would not think it was a python you know they don't have external heat pits they feel completely different they don't hang on even though she is hanging on with her tail which is kind of rare they don't typically hang on to you you have to hold them otherwise they'll fall versus just about every other python will wrap around you and get a good get a good hold um they just feel like a completely different animal. Uh, Mitch, let's see. I have two mineral oil diffusers. They're like humidifiers, but these release natural mineral oil. Is it safe? No, it's not. Um, no, it... Uh, it's not safe. And, um, so, some of those oils could be, but I don't know which ones are and which ones aren't. So I don't use them at all. I like those, those oil diffusers. They're really cool. I also like candles and I like incense and stuff, but I don't have any of that in here. Um, snakes have really sensitive respiratory systems. And, uh, so any kind of smoke or, or like oil diffusion stuff is not good for them to breathe. So I would not have it in your snake room. Um, it's not an immediate death sentence, but if you, depending on what oil you're using, if it's got something that these snakes are highly sensitive to, you're going to, you're going to have snakes with problems. So I would, I would keep that out of the snake room. Um, Rakawan, if you're asking, so you're saying I'm also interested in what kind of bird they eat. If you're asking about, about Maya, the black headed python, uh, I feed her quail and, uh, day old chicks. So ch chickens, chicken chicks, but I think quail is probably healthier for her. Um, and then she has, uh, she's got reptilinks that are, that are a mix of a number of things. So, so it's mainly quite well i don't know if it's mainly but it's a mix of like quail rabbit a few other things and uh she gets those occasionally that's that's a huge protein boost though so i don't i don't try to give those to her at every meal um whereas like the super dwarves could could get that for every meal uh and i just wouldn't feed them as often but with with her i'm i'm just you know i'm i'm cognizant of the fact that they eat way more often in the wild but they're eating food that's not very nutritionally dense. They're eating reptiles and reptiles are not nearly as nutritionally dense as a rodent is. 
So if I was feeding her a rodent twice a week, she'd get fat, but I'm feeding her mostly iguana, reptile, lynx, and birds twice a week. And then she gets an occasional rodent. In fact, she got a, she got a mouse the other day. Um, so that's that. Uh, let's see. I have two ball pythons. My year old snake is very chill. The other wanders all over when handling. He is young and only a few months old. Is this a personality thing or an age thing? I mean, both. Possibly. It's, you know, it's hard to tell sometimes because snakes do have different personalities, but they also change what they change their tendencies. As, as they get older. So, you know, you could say, oh, my snake has this personality. They tend to do this. But then next month, they don't do that anymore. They've changed something. Uh, and it's because they've just gotten older and and uh, they're, they don't always act how you expect them to act based on what you've seen them do before, you know. So that's why I think it's important to, to just watch for that and to understand that your snake is not going to always be the same way you know, and this is this is really important with stuff like cohabbing. You know, somebody buys two snakes that have lived together for their whole life, and these are ball pythons, and they bought them from somebody who was selling them, and they and you know, I'm selling them together because they they're used to one another, and I don't want them separated. And the first thing that should happen is they should probably be separated uh, and see how they do. You know, but um, as we talked about in the beginning of this live stream. A lot of times cohab snakes do great for a little while and then all of a sudden they don't do well. So not cool to not cool to cohab your snakes. Um, let's see. Maya is trying to dig into my leg. I think she probably wants to, um, let me put her back and I'll get Anya out. Anya is the, is the new azanthic snake from that I got from gray family snakes. Um, hold on a second. Let me, so here's your last look at Maya. I'm going to put her back because she was looking to burrow into my leg. Okay. little one. Here you go. I'm going to tell you guys something uh, that I was going to keep a secret, but this is kind of a secret. There's only a limited number of people that watch the live streams. So Black Box Cages is building Maya a cage. And with it will be a hide that that will be open on top. The hole will be on top instead of on the front because black-headed pythons like to burrow. So when they go in the top, it feels like they're going down into the earth. And uh, so I'm going to have the first one. And then they might be offering that to people who keep Womas and black-headed pythons and such, uh, which I think would be a really great product because there are a few snakes that like to burrow and having, um, you know, I think most people that keep black headed pythons and Wilma's a lot of times they'll take a Tupperware container and put the hole in the lid and then let the snake crawl into the Tupperware container, but it's cool to have it an actual hide. I'm excited about it. All right. Let me hang on. Do a little Purell here and then I'll grab Anya. Anya's getting big. She's getting an upgraded enclosure very soon. She's out of quarantine now and uh, ready for a larger enclosure. Oh, Lori Gray is in the chat. Hi, Lori. Uh, Lori is 
Lori Gray from Gray Family Snakes, which is where Anya came from. So let me grab her real quick. Hey, who's this cute little snake? What are you doing? What are you doing, little one? This is, uh, let me adjust my situation here. This little girl is, I mean, I didn't really do anything as far as working with her to socialize her. She just, she kind of came out of the box that way. And, um, I mean, I do, I do work with her on a regular basis, but she's never, she's never shown signs of fear. She's just, she's just really interactive and, uh, curious and she belongs, she belongs to Kent, uh, as, as Lori is mentioning right, right there. She does belong to Kent. Has Kent held her? No, but has he come within a few feet of her? Also no. Uh, but maybe one of these days, you know, she is doing well. She eats like a champ. She never refused a meal. And uh, she's super cute. You know, it's interesting. You would think that with all the with all the colors, you know, we we breed ball pythons for all these color morphs and stuff like that that are so cool. But you get a you get a uh, what's what's the word that I'm thinking of? Um, sepi tone. This is kind of is that the word sepi tone, where it's black and white, but it also has the that kind of brownish that goes into the black that's that's like a that's like an old one of those old family photos sepi tone i feel like that's the right word um but it might not be i'm just not sure anyway the, my point is that this is as cool if not cooler than the colorful snakes in fact i'm gonna grab a colorful snake also and the other thing is that this doesn't show up on camera but she I mean, maybe it does, but she looks like velvet. She looks very velvety. Thanks, Patricia, for clarifying. It is sepia tone, se sepia tone. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong. Um, sepia, yeah. Sepia tone, that's what it is. Oh, every everybody's saying it. <laughs> sepia. Sepia tone. That's right. It's a word that I haven't said in a very long time, obviously. Give me give me one minute. Talk amongst yourselves. Okay, I just downed a full glass of water and now I'm grabbing another snake that has colors and we'll compare. So Rod put his toe out and now this is <clears throat> one of the most beautiful colorful snakes to come out of my last clutch. Uh, this snake is number two. He's an orange dream inchy calico asphalt. And uh, he's super beautiful. But man, in my opinion, the azanthic snakes are as cool as the, the crazy colorful snakes. Now she's she's a pastel azanthic. She's also het for pied. But she's got some she's got some cool uh, blushing that that happens because of the pastel. And um, this young man is all sorts of orange dream, inchy calico asphalt stuff. He's looking good.
Taylor saying she's going to have a hard time staying away from these antics at the Rep Reptile Expo this weekend. Have fun at the Reptile Expo. Those are fun. I was just up at the High Desert uh, Reptile Expo that I just wandered up to and saw some people and saw some cool snakes. Uh, those those azanthics in person, they look so cool. You'll probably run into some, Taylor, and my guess is maybe you'll pick one up. Uh, Natty's Garden, have the babies from your latest clutch all found homes? Uh, there's one that has not found a home yet. It's not, it's not this one, this one I'm holding for now. Um, I'll show you the one that is still available in a, in a second here. I think, tell you what, I'm going to put, I'm going to put Anya back because I pulled her out when she was sleeping. I pulled this young man out. Uh, he was at the front of his tub. He's awake and moving around, but. Anya was sleeping, so let me put her back. Okay. Hey there, little one. These two are these two are clutch mates. This one uh, I'm holding for Lori Weiser for now. He's hanging out with me, as is B. Arthur Dent, the little one. Uh, these two are will go together when they go. And then this uh, this little boy is, uh, is still available. And the way this works, for those of you who don't know, is when I have a clutch hatching, I hit up my Patreon and I make a waiting list on Patreon for people who are potentially interested in a snake. And I, I do that when the snakes start to pip. So we don't know what we have yet. And the waiting list is just people that, um, uh, that are potentially interested in a snake. And then I go based on who went on the list first, I just go straight down the list and let them know what I have available. And if they want one, they can, they can buy it. Um, a lot of times I I'll end up with like one or two left out of the clutch after that. And so this little boy is left and I don't do, you know, like I don't have a morph morph market account. I don't, I don't do much sales work on the, <laughs> these things, but, uh, I do have this little guy. He's a, um, he's an orange dream calico asphalt. That's it. Orange dream calico asphalt. He's super cute. And I like his, he looks very burnt orange compared to this young man. Let me see if I can get a good shot. So look at the difference in those oranges. It's pretty cool. Joseph, thanks for the super chat. You didn't even ask a question with it. I appreciate that though. Thanks so much. You guys, have I missed any super chats while I've been talking? Somebody tell me if I missed any. Let me just scroll up really fast. Quick scroll up. I think I'm good. Okay. Um, blackhead spot nose combo. Does the blackhead influence more than the spot nose? Looking to add it in the future. I don't know. Uh, I I don't work with blackhead, so I don't. I'm I'm really not a morph expert. I try to learn as much as I can about the morphs that I that I have in, in my group of snakes, but I really am not, a, I'm not great at like IDing every ball Python or whatever. And, uh, um, blackhead is not a morph that I, that I deal with not to be confused with the blackheaded Python, which is a different type of Python, a different species versus the blackhead morph in ball pythons. That's confusing that we name morphs after actual species of pythons. That's something totally different.
<laughs> Joseph is asking me to please take a shot of scotch. First of all, Joseph, you do not take shots of scotch. You pour yourself a scotch and you enjoy it slowly. Um, but I will actually, I don't have scotch today, even though this is snakes and scotch, but I will uh, pour a little bit more of this bourbon. I can get the top off. Look at this. I can, I can handle two snakes and pour bourbon at the same time. I feel like that deserves some sort of award or something, right? Hey, little one, you trying to crawl on my hat? I don't know if that would be the safest thing for you. You're a little small for that. Mm. You guys, if you're ever in Sacramento, look up the J.J. Fister Distilling Company. J.J. Fister. They're so cool over there, and they've got such a great... It's a, it's a really neat atmosphere, and they've got good food and stuff like that. I will, I will go there every time I'm going through Sacramento from now on. Highly recommend. Uh, John, this is a great question. Now that Kent has a new snake, did he end up rehoming his first one, Eric the Murderer? No, he still has Eric the Murderer because Eric the Murderer is the only snake that he'll handle because that's a puppet. For those of you who don't know, it's a puppet from Ikea. And uh, he has yet to get anywhere near his actual snake, Anya, because he believes that she will eventually develop poison, poison, uh, become colorful, and uh, start murdering people. So we'll see how that goes. We'll see if Anya actually does do that. Because you never know in this world. You never know. But you can take an educated guess. <laughs> I think I think we're safe with Anya. Um, oh, Michael, you're talking to Lori about this. So uh, I don't know if I said it, but, but Anya is... Uh, VPI Azanthic Hepide. I did say that, I think. VPI Azanthic Hepide, and she's pastel also. Um, pastel works really nicely in Azanthics. I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw pastel into every project, uh, but there are a few things that pastel works really nicely with, and Azanthic is one of them. I'm going to, I'm going to answer this, even though you're talking to Lori, but, but people should know gray, gray family snakes is on morph market. They still have, I think a couple clutches on there with some really cool xanthics and uh, just look up gray family snakes on, on morph market. They've got some, they've got some really great stuff. I think they sold my, my favorite one that was, that was on there. There was a, there was a, uh, a xanthic leopard can't remember what else it was. It was het for it was for some stuff. Oh, it was pied. It was an xanthic leopard pied, maybe inchy also. Anyway, it sold the day that that the video came out that Gray Family Snake sponsored, I think. Um, but they have a bunch of other cool ones. Um, 81. Yeah, we talked about this in the beginning of the live stream, but uh, I grew up since I was a kid, I was a lizard guy. I mean, I've had more lizards in my life uh, than than snakes in the past, like from childhood to adulthood. I, I almost always had some type of lizard. I've had iguanas. I've had bearded dragons. I've had chameleons. Um, I've had little like gnolls and stuff like that. Uh, but I have snakes only right now because... I, I'm gone a lot. I, I go on tour a lot and, and I'm gone for extended periods. And uh, it's easy to have somebody come in once a week to change waters um, for the snakes or every few days or so to change waters. But I can't have an animal that requires food every single day if, if I'm on the road a lot. So, so I have snakes right now, but I love lizards. I'm a big fan. And there's I have a whole list that I would have if, if I wasn't touring. And that might be a thing. If I if I stop touring as much, you know, uh, 
then then maybe I get lizards and and this becomes a whole thing and I have an entire reptile zoo in my house. Who knows? Who knows what the fu- what the future holds, you guys? Okay, so I'm all right. I'm I'm seeing this back and forth of Lori Gray and and Michael. Are you on Morph Market? What's your business name? All that stuff. Okay, so I answered all that. I'm just catching. I'm just way behind in the in the live stream. Okay, now I think I'm caught up. Oh, Roger's on now. Hey, Roger. Uh, I'm glad that you all are on. Yeah, I went to a great home of one of your viewers. Yeah, it was my, it was my fault that my favorite snake is gone. I wonder who got it. If uh, if you're in the chat, whoever whoever got that uh, leopard, exanthic, pied, and whatever it was, tell me, uh, speak up. I want to know who got that snake. Um, Chris Perkins, do you ever go out around Ohio at all? No, I've, I've done stand up in Ohio before. What was the comedy club that I used to do? This was, this was 10 years ago, but there was a con, there was a little comedy club in Ohio. I don't know what it was called. Anyway, I haven't been to Ohio in years, but I do remember that I was there in the middle of winter to do this club. I can't even remember what city I was in, but it was the coldest I've ever been in my life. And I grew up in the North Northwest and I've done comedy shows in Alaska in the wintertime in Kodiak, Alaska. And I was colder in Ohio by far than I was in Kodiak, Alaska in the middle of winter. I can't believe how cold it gets in Ohio. It was like negative 112. That's a guess. I don't know how accurate it is, but that's what it felt like. That's what it was. It was the albino that I was missing. She was leopard, azanthic, pied, 100% het albino. That's right. That would be interesting to see what the albino... I don't know what al, what albino does to in, in pied. Hey, gentlemen, can I just keep you in my hands instead of trying to fall off me? Look at, how, look at this. Look at this beautiful... Now let's talk about orange dream for a second. Let's go... Let's go the opposite of azanthic and look at beautiful oranges. I love the difference here in this guy's burnt orange versus this one's very bright orange. And that, you know, there's a couple of genes that that would potentially cause that. I think he's probably extreme gene also, although I'm not good at, that's a subtle gene and I'm not good at, at, identifying it. So I don't usually, unless I'm, unless I'm sure I don't usually say, but I think he's probably extreme gene and that might be what's brightening him up so much. Also the inchy wood as well. Uh, so these two oranges from these two brothers out of the same clutch are very different and cool. Oh, let me get rid of the stem. Lock user. Does that get rid of all of them? And they're gone. Great. Okay. Danielle, you're having Kent withdrawals. <laughs> yes, we can. We can do a Kent heavy video. We'll have to we'll have to figure that out. I'm I'm planning some. I'm planning the next videos right now. We got a Christmas extravaganza coming up, you guys. That's, I mean, it's an extravaganza. Let me put these two crazy boys back really fast. All right. I might take out another snake here in a minute, but let me, let me get through a question or two. Oh my gosh, you guys, we've been going so long. 
Are you serious? We're two hours and 49 minutes into this. This is insane. We have to, we have to end this at some point. Um, but look at this. We still have 80 people watching. I'm guessing a lot of those are people who have jumped in recently. And some people have jumped off three hours is a long time. You guys, we are, I'll, I'll tell you this, we're at two hours and 50 minutes. We are not going over three hours. So we're on the last leg of this. That went, that went so fast. You guys, you're making me have all this fun. And then I don't keep track of time. Uh, Kayla is saying, I'm not convinced the burnt orange one is orange dream unless one of the parents was a super. Is there a way you know for sure? Yeah, uh, just that there were some non-orange dreams in, in that clutch that, that weren't that. Uh, so I'm uh, I'm pretty, pretty sure that he's orange dream because the non-orange dreams just didn't have didn't have orange in that clutch. But they are definitely, I mean, the brightness on the on the one versus the burnt orange on the other uh, is pretty crazy. But again, I'm not a I'm not a morph uh, encyclopedia, so I could always be wrong about stuff. But he is very orange compared to the non-orange dreams in that clutch. So I would say pretty confidently that he's orange dream. Okay, let's see. Outbad Brutal is asking me to talk about the Christmas extravaganza. I can't. It's a full extravaganza that is completely under wraps right now, but it's going to be amazing. There is going to be Rockettes. Um, trying to think of other things that... Do you remember the Christmas shows in the 80s? Whoever is, is sort of my age where you were around in the 80s. And there was the Rockettes were always part of the Christmas shows. I'm trying to think of who else was. Bing Crosby. Bing Crosby is going to be in. The, it's going to be Bing Crosby and the Rockettes and the Snakes. That's what the Christmas ex extravaganza is going to be. I'm kidding. There's no dancing. Uh, but it is what I'm working on this week. And I think it's coming out next week, actually. I think next week's video is the Christmas extravaganza. I'll, uh, I'll say that much, at least. Erica, I do many shows in Southern California. Um, yeah, I do shows in Southern California. I'm not doing any soon. Oh, actually, yes, I am. I'm doing. I'm doing a show. <laughs> I'm doing a show uh, this Saturday, but it's really quick, and it's at it's at my favorite pub called Idle Hour, and Idle Hour is a fantastic bar slash restaurant in. North Hollywood and I'm friends with those guys and they hire me twice a year to come and juggle fire inside their building and their building is a big barrel. It's, it was built. I think it was like in the fifties, maybe the sixties when they were building thing they, they were, they were constructing buildings to look like other things. So this is a building that's a barrel and uh, it's a really cool place. And I go there a lot and I perform there twice a year. And so they have this Harry Potter themed Yule ball. It's a Christmas party that's Harry Potter themed. And I um, go there and juggle flaming battle axes and flaming chainsaw blades and stuff like that in, inside the barrel, which is basically just a bunch of kindling waiting to be caught on fire. And maybe I'm the guy to do it. So that happens this Saturday. Other than that, I don't have any festival gigs coming up until next year. Uh, and and yeah, I do I do a number of shows in Southern California. So
you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Kent's corner has said I I can tell you that as creative as this is I'm confident that this isn't actually Kent just because he doesn't know how to do any technology that's beyond like 1989. And so for him to get on a YouTube live and create a chat would be so beyond I'm I'm 97% positive that this is not Actually, Kent, but you never know. You never know. <laughs> it's very funny, though. I mean... I mean, it does sound like Kent. It's a good... It's a good impersonation. If it, if it's not actually Kent, I would be shocked if it was. But uh, Chris, I have a bunch of old stuff on YouTube. I don't I don't do my I don't put my festival shows on YouTube. Uh, I try to keep that off of social media just because that's a written show that I don't want to just give away. Um, but there's a lot of like old stand up and, and stuff on, on YouTube, a ton of like sketches and stand up and such like that, just randomly. Um, Erica wants to see Echo. Let's see if I can bring Echo out. We're, we're, we only have a few minutes left. Um, but in the last few minutes, why not try to get Echo out and see if she'll come out without trying to eat me? Cause she's here. Like, so the thing about echo, you guys is this is a highly food motivated snake. As many of you know, and this is evening time. So this is not the time that I bring her out to be handled. Normally I've opened her door. She's also not a snake that you just, I'm, I'm meant to bring her out anyway. So we actually might go a little bit over three hours just so that I can fully show you her size. Cause I think a lot of you maybe haven't seen echo in a while. And, um, oh my God, she's coming at me with the biggest eyes. She totally thinks that she's being fed. I gotta hang on. I gotta do a hook situation with her. Hey lady, you relax. You relax. Look at, look at, that's not food, right? That's not food. That's a hook. You calm down. Crazy. <laughs> so Echo's been in a in a growth spurt, uh, and I've been feeding her heavier than than I was before. Um, let me see if I can pull her out. Hey, lady, come here. You were ridiculous. Oh, you were crazy. She's so strong. So this tiny girl recently was able to fit easily into a small, like one of those small black hides. And um, she had a small black hide for a really long time that was like her sky hide. And I've changed that. I've changed that to a uh, medium hide instead of the little tiny, you know, the little tiny ones are like, are like this. They're just a little tiny. And she was, she was still very long, but she was so thin that she could, uh, she could fit into those. So she's now, you know, like if you, if you're one of the people who watch my live streams a lot, you'll know that I sometimes bring her out and she'll spend, she, the last couple of times she would spend most of the time hunting me. Like you could tell that she was just waiting and she, at one point when I was doing the Patreon scroll, she, she grabbed my arm and that was a fun little moment. Uh, so I started feeding her small rats and, uh, on the advice of, um, Lucas, there's a channel. If you're into, uh, especially dwarf and super dwarf reticulated pythons, the retic lounge is a great channel. 
um, it's two guys who chat about super dwarf retics and it's Lucas and Nathan. And, uh, they're, they're really great guys, good keepers, a lot of knowledge. And, uh, so I like their channel, but, um, anyway, Lucas told me that, that, uh, that I should be feeding her heavier. And I kind of agree. I think that, that, you know, I was, I was feeding, I mean, I think it, maybe it was fine when she was smaller before she started this growth, this growth spurt. But I think it's important with, especially with dwarf and super dwarf retics that you feed them enough. You're not, that you're not trying to stunt their growth by feeding them a small amount. You know, you want to feed them enough to where they grow to their potential size and this, her genetics, uh, make it so that her potential size is going to be very small, but she still needs to get there. You know, uh, I don't want to be stunting her in, in, any more than her genetics will stunt her growth, you know? Uh, so, so she's getting big and, um, and Stella is the same. St Stella is about the same size. Uh, just bigger. I don't know if you can, I don't know if you can tell from like last time you saw her on whatever video. Lori can tell. <laughs> okay, you guys. We're going to end it with that. That's a, that's a three hour live stream that we did. I just did a marathon live stream. Thanks for sticking with me. You guys, there's a lot of you who've been in the chat for since, since the beginning. And I appreciate that. You all are fantastic. We'll do another one of these in a few weeks. And until then, I hope everyone has great holidays and such like that. Uh, that's it. Okay, I'm done. See you guys next time.